So good morning, everyone. It is eight o'clock. We are watching our uh, little uh, window here that has everybody logging in. We're going to give everybody just a few more minutes as we see uh, the early risers are here this morning, but we're going to wait for some more people to uh, fill our room uh, before we get today's event started. So just uh, uh, hold on and we'll be uh, getting started momentarily, everybody. Once again, good morning for those of you that are just joining or wait just another minute or two while everybody logs in and uh, we'll start our presentation momentarily. All right, so it looks like we got a good group this morning. The numbers are kind of leveling off, so I think we will go ahead and get our day started. How about that, everybody? Good morning. Uh, welcome to the 19th Annual Biopreservation Association Symposium. Uh, my name is Christopher Brown. I'm Secretary of the Biopreservation Association's Executive Committee, and just going to be introducing everybody today and uh, back in the control room at HGAC, uh, we have Andrea, uh, who has uh, done wonders in getting us ready for today and, and is going to guide us through all the technical stuff today. If you have any technical issues, uh, she's already dropped a link in the chat uh, that you can uh, ask questions and, uh, and get some help if you do have any technical issues. But hopefully at this point, we've all gotten used to the, uh, the Zooms of the world and, and we'll have another good event. This is the second time we've done this virtually. Uh, but uh, had a really good year last year. Obviously, we um, have, have made lemons, uh, lemonade out of lemons, and, and uh, we have another good two-day event this year. I think that this actual format is working really well for us and allows us to reach a broader audience, which is great for the association. Uh, and today's topic especially, we think, is, is going to be very uh, interesting to everybody and important to get out to the masses. And so uh, we appreciate your 
uh, participation today and uh, look forward to your comments and questions, which you can do uh, if you haven't used Zoom before. If you uh, just hover down to the lower part of your screen, you'll see the uh, chat box. If you click on that, you can ask your questions of the speakers and I will kind of collate those during uh, everybody's presentations and ask the speaker speakers uh, at the end um, some questions uh, if y'all have any uh, throughout the day. So. Um, so this, this symposium, as I mentioned, has been going on for 19 years now, and, and uh, it is our largest educational event. Um, you know, usually brings around 200 people each year, and looks like we have no exception to that kind of attendance the, uh, this year. And it, it is a way for biopreservation to, in essence, talk to everybody about uh, what we believe in. And this year, we decided that the topic of green infrastructure was really uh, apropos. We have uh, always talked about something to do with the bayous. That is our charter, after all. Um, but in, in, in what we call our, uh, our CPR for the bayous, uh, we celebrate, protect, and restore the natural richness of all of our bayous and streams. That's our, that's our charter. And uh, having green infrastructure be at the forefront of this year's presentation uh, was a way of shining a light on what is currently a uh, an option, uh, but perhaps we should think about green infrastructure being the standard for the way that we think about uh, stormwater drainage, the way we think about the beauty of our city and our region, um, how we treat our bayous. And so that's what uh, these two days of speakers are going to be talking the most about. Um, so I think that uh, let's do a quick poll just uh, so we can get a flavor for how our audience uh, has joined us in the past, because like I mentioned, we've been doing this for a while now. Uh, so Andrea, let's launch our first poll. And we're going to be asking some questions about, uh, have you attended this before? And so to uh, to do the poll, you just uh, do some clicking there. Everybody's got it. All right. Answers are coming in. So I see we've got some newbies. Some of y'all have attended a few times before. We're going to give massive kudos for those that are doing the I've attended them all. <laughs> So that's a few more seconds of voting. We almost got everybody on about 80% now. And again, you don't have to vote, but uh, this is the interactive portion of today's event for y'all. <laughs> so great, that's leveled out. We're gonna go ahead and end that poll and you can see the results there. So interesting, um, got, got a fair amount of newbies. Welcome everyone, we hope you enjoy this. Um, a lot of people that have returned uh, in uh, over five years. That's awesome. Uh, so let's go to our next poll question. And there it is, poll question number two. What brings you back this year? Why did you come back? You've been with us before. And so uh, what did you see that uh, um, you wanted to see again? Or what were you hoping to learn this time? So obviously, uh, we, we do have opportunities for continuing education units. Um, you know, networking and tree beards were, were always big ones for me. I always wanted that tree beards lunch. And hopefully, we'll get back to that uh, in the coming years. We really do enjoy doing this live uh, and, in, and in person. But uh, we're doing this. Hopefully, this will be the last time uh, that we have to do it in this, in this venue. However, uh, like I said, this is a good way for us to reach out to more people than we, than we do when we were actually uh, holding it in person. So, all right, kind of leveled off there. So I'm going to go ahead and end this poll as well. So yeah, themes and specific speakers. Uh, and, and I got to tell you, the symposium committee uh, works pretty tirelessly for a good eight months to put these on each year. And coming up with the themes and and the great list list of speakers uh, is is uh, uh, well actually I enjoy it I've been on the committee for over ten years now and we take a lot of pride in in coming up with a, a good list of, of qualified people that really have something to say and something to present um, making this uh, just a great event for everyone and so uh, glad that, glad you think that that's a value as well and you're coming back so let's go to our final poll question right now number three for the morning or for this segment. So if you could donate about 10 hours of your time per year towards the, the health of our bayous, 
where would you most be inclined to spend that time? Um, we have monitor, water, uh, monitor of uh, water quality. We do have an invasive plant species removal program. Obviously, we have trash pickups. The trash bash happens each year. Um, we also do uh, speaking to, to groups. We do have bio tours. Um, and uh, let's see what everyone wants to do, wants to donate their time on. <laughs> We do have a citizen science program that does water quality monitoring. Um, a very successful program. Uh, we have a number of volunteers doing that. We have volunteers and, and actually paid con, uh, paid uh, consultants, or not consultants, but we have con subcontractors, that's what I meant to say, uh, that do invasive plant species removal, which really helps to protect the side slopes of our bayous. What you may not know sometimes is that, you know, in, in general, the, the slopes uh, of, the, of the bayous um, and I'm going to end the poll here. Uh, the slopes of the bayous are, are very sandy and those inv uh, invasive species choke out our native species, which have a different root structure, which helps protect and stabilize the, the side slopes of the bayou. So when we have our flooding events, uh, the, the rush of the water uh, starts to erode those side slopes and the invasives don't do a good job of holding that soil in place as that water's rushing by. Uh, and so that's why it's important to get those things out and allow the native species to do what they do, uh, which, which is, you know, nature's way of, of holding those, those banks and, and keeping them in place while uh, the, the storm events are distributing the water off. So, so great. Well, thank you for participating in that first poll. We're going to do one of these after each of our breaks today. Uh, and uh, now we're going to um, get, uh, get into it. I think we're going to introduce kind of a, once again, our topic, and then I've got a couple of things that, uh, that we want to, to uh, uh, first announce. Um, actually, why don't, should we do that? Let's do that first. How about that? Uh, I think what I'll do first is I'm gonna introduce Paul Nelson, uh, who is our board chair, and uh, really pleasant to, uh, to have Paul around. He has succeeded um, uh, uh, an individual that he's going to honor in just a second who, who had his position for quite some time. It's very, very exciting for Paul uh, coming in this, uh, uh, as, as our new board chair. We also had to uh, get a new president and CEO, which he's going to introduce. And uh, very pleasured uh, to have him with us this morning. Great to work with you on the executive committee, Paul. And uh, you're up. You're on. Thank you, Chris. I really appreciate it. I, I am excited to be here, and I, it's, a, it's been an exciting time. I think that's maybe a euphemism when we had our CEO and president uh, take another task and, and move. So I was kind of faced with that on my first few months with all the help from the executive committee and everybody else. Uh, I am excited to be here and excited for this, this particular the function, I guess I've been to many of these over the past years, but uh, as Chris said, this is the 19th and uh, it's so good to see so much good response. One of the most exciting things again was the, that we just a few weeks ago uh, found and hired a new president and CEO, uh, Brittany Flowers. You may have seen her in all the newspapers. I mean, the, the articles every day about her and, and, and what she's going to do for us and how excited she is to be a part of this association. Uh, I'd like Brittany to say a few words. I want to first thank all the people that made this happen. I said the sponsors, uh, the speakers, and especially the committee that Chris talked about uh, you know, so much work went into it and they've done such a good job of, of bringing us these presentations. But again, you've read about it. Now let Brittany Flowers introduce herself and, and say hello to this group. Good morning, Brittany. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I just wanna take a moment and, and say to those that I have met already and those who I plan to meet, uh, thank you for the warm welcome. Thank you for being a space uh, for me to learn and for me to grow into this association and the, the work that we do here. Uh, I won't take too much time because we have a lot of amazing speakers today and a lot to cover over the next two days. But I wanted to mention that I am 
very happy to be leading the organization. Um, our bayous are so important to the region. We're, we're called the Bayou City for a reason. Um, the bayous, the health of our bayous dictate uh, the health of so much, and especially the Houstonians that uh, take recreation and refuge in the bayou. So I'm thankful to be leading the organization and, and many of the programs that Chris introduced into the next stage of uh, our growth. And I am looking forward to learning again very much over the next two days. And if I haven't met you all already, I hope that you will send me an email with your availability so we can organize a time to, to get to know each other and grow in, in this working relationship. So um, I won't take too much time. I think I'll be speaking to you all again tomorrow. Um, I'll give it back to Chris and I wanna say thank you for your participation. And um, I look forward to learning with you over the next two days. Well, Brittany, thanks so much. Really glad you're on board. It's a pleasure to work with you and uh, look forward to our success uh, in, the, in the future. Um, uh, Paul did mention the efforts of the, of the committee that, that forms this, as, as did I. And I just wanted to recognize the, the firms that uh, allow us to participate um, in, in organizing this and putting on today's event. Um, individuals from AECOM, uh, the City of Houston, uh, EHRA Engineering, Harris County Engineering and also HGAC. Uh, all of those organizations and, and firms uh, allow uh, their their workers to uh, donate their time to the Bio Preservation Association and to the committee. And and uh, like I said, it takes about eight months of work to to put this on. So thank you so much to all of them, and thank you to our sponsors. Uh, this is a uh, it, it is a minor fundraiser for our event, but it, I would be uh, wrong to not indicate that it is a fundraiser. Uh, we have others that are much more important from a dollar standpoint, because I mentioned this is our largest educational program that we put out. And so, uh, uh, again, wouldn't be possible without our sponsors. And you'll see those slides during a bio breaks uh, for those organizations that have done uh, such a generous giving to us to make this possible. So. Uh, Paul, I believe that we have something that we need to do. We need to recognize uh, your previous uh, chairholder. Um, yeah, yeah. And, I, and I wanted to mention too that Brittany basically started work a few days before she really started. She dug into it and, and I know that she's gonna be great for this organization, you can tell. Uh, so, you know, even in such a short period of time that she dedicated to making this a great continuing to be a great organization. And speaking of great organizations, as Chris mentioned, uh, Robert Rayburn was, is a member, continues to be a member. And uh, he also was chair for almost a decade prior to me and then, then handed the, the honor over to me. And I hope I can do as well as he did. But I wanted to, uh, to my right, you'll see what appears to be the top of a wooden paddle. I don't think there's much that symbolizes uh, bayous and waterways more than a canoe and a kayak and a paddle. So rather than the other traditional, we got him a paddle uh, to stimulate him and as well as to celebrate. And on the paddle, there's a plaque, a brass plaque that, that reads as follows. Robert Rayburn, Chair, Bayou Preservation Association 2012 through 2021 in appreciation of Robert's exemplary leadership and dedication to the principles and tenets of the Bayou Preservation Association. Uh, I want him to hang it in his new shop, uh, perhaps stimulate him to go be a kayaker or in his new home. But uh, I just wanna thank Robert. I said, personally, you've helped me during this time and, and I know what you've done for the Bayou Preservation Association. And, uh, We'd like you to, I know people want to thank him for that service that most of you have been through that with him. And in the chat, I think it'd be nice to let Robert know. I'm sure he's with us. Thank you, Chris. No, thank you, Paul. I appreciate that. And I echo those sentiments very much. Robert has been wonderful for the organization over a, even a longer time than his tenure uh, as, as chair. But um, uh, we wish him well on his, uh, his new retirement. So uh let's get into today's event so uh as i mentioned what we are or why we are here today uh talking about green infrastructure um everybody's seeing the screen i believe looks like it's working on my end so uh why green infrastructure um 
to steal a little bit of a, of a uh, line from a, from a movie uh, you may remember called Wall Street. <laughs> Green, for lack of a better word, is good. Um, the idea that we, we have often thought of those of us that maybe are on the ground uh, a lot in, in, in building this, this region, this, this uh, uh, entire city of Houston region, which encompasses so much more than just the city itself. Um, green is something that maybe you, re you can see from the air when you fly in. I know that I have that experience when I, I return to town and you look down from the airplane and, and you see, oh, this is a very green city, but maybe it doesn't appear that way when you're on the ground. Maybe it looks like it's gray and concrete. Um, from the bayou standpoint, the way that we're viewing this is why isn't green the standard? Why are we still looking at drainage facilities from a, uh, a standpoint of, well, how much water can it hold and how much water can it get off? Well, those are important questions and, and they have to be answered to, to protect our region. But in the meantime, as we build new communities and the detention requirements are, uh, are invoked and, and we build facilities that protect us from flooding, uh, can we not do those in a, in a more green infrastructure way? Can we not design streets in a, in a, in a different way? Can we not design uh, detention? Can we not honor our bayous in a way where green infrastructure can have an impact? Um, we believe unequivocally that an, that, that answer is, is yes. Uh, because the, you know, how long is, are, are these kind of images going to be okay for our region? Uh, is, is this the kind of detention that, that we should live with, where it's stuck in the back of a yard and you just put the fence up and you don't worry about it and, uh, you know, it gets, it gets overgrown, there's trees growing in that picture. Um, you know, it, it can, can we do something different than just having uh, the, the large pipes that, that drain our neighborhoods and it just sits and, you know, becomes a mucky area? Uh, is there something better than, than the, you know, managed four to one, seven to one side slope, whatever that, that just has a, an area that you can't even get the mower down into in the middle. You know, these are all examples of things that, that are out there, right? And they cause us to think, how long can we put up with this? Should we put up with this? Um, there are uh, options in place at Harris County uh, for, and, and other counties for approving infrastructure that looks different than this. So why shouldn't we require people to do something different than this? Because is this anywhere that anybody wants to be, right? We have examples that say that our bayous and our natural areas can be wonderful. And we've experienced during COVID even more use of those when they are great places to be. Obviously these three pictures don't look like great places to be, but they could be because it could look like this. This is possible. This was a transformation of exactly what I just showed you. One of those standard V-shaped ditches uh, that we had to mow and people had to get down in here and, and clean out the muck and they got hip waders on and used, used machetes to cut the middle part because you can't get a lawnmower down there and battled snakes and stuff. This was transformed into such a feature for the neighborhood that they actually decided to name it after one of their, their neighborhood residents. This is now called the Lou Maltz Greenway. And this was one of those just ugly, don't worry about it, leave it alone, never look at it kind of areas. And now it's it's full of wildlife. It has a jogging trail around it. Uh, again, it was named for, for someone they felt it's so special that they wanted to honor a, a resident, Lou Maltz. Um, and, and look at what this, this adds to this community. Uh, I'll take this a little bit further and show you, you know, the proof of, of what this used to look like. That there is the Lou Maltz Greenway uh, on the left as it started with one of those big pipes and you can see the side slopes mode and everything. That middle picture is how we, uh, it was transformed uh, initially just to create the, the lake effect. Uh, and then finally, when the first plants were added uh, on the right hand side, this is a Harris County flood control district facility. And so in partnership with one of the local MUDs, it was Houston uh, or Harris County MUD 188 that did this project. Um, it is possible to transform these areas into something that is not only beautiful, but useful. Not f and, 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 you know, from a flooding standpoint, it does its job. It manages the stormwater coming out of the neighborhood. Uh, it, it protects the bayous from the overflows by releasing the stormwater in a, in a manner that the bayou can handle it. It doesn't overload the bayou. And then it's, it's absolutely gorgeous, so much so that there's a jogging trail around the whole thing. And residents and wildlife are now inhabiting this area where before it was something you turned your back to. 
So we really can do this. Another example of a very similar way to do it, this is Mandolin Gardens. If y'all haven't seen this, it's, it's amazing. You can see this is a, a more constructed way of handling it, but equally as beautiful. Um, a wide variety of plant species inhabit this, this uh, redo of, of a similar drainage ditch. And now it's, it's full of trails. You can, it even has a bridge that you can get on and you can see that island in the middle of the photograph uh, has, has a little trail on it that you, that you can walk on. So we're, you're inhabiting the middle of this area, actually, not even just, just on, the, on the sides. You get to experience all of this. And, and if you look at the width of it uh, from a neighborhood standpoint, how much park area and then over the length of it, how many acres of recreation have been added uh, to a feature uh, which was previously just something you didn't, didn't go into. And then on the right hand side, you see this is what it does in a stormwater event. It does its job. It fills with stormwater. It protects the neighborhood from flooding and it protects the bayous from being over overfilled. So we have the technologies and we have the examples of doing green infrastructure in a way that is really to our advantage and performs exactly as it's designed to do uh, while sharing you know, beauty with the community, sharing recreational opportunities. We should have more of this. That's what all of today is about. We need to do more of this. We can use the examples of green infrastructure that we have uh, and, and do more of them. And we should do them all over the whole region. There's other examples of how this can work. This is up in Paul's area. Paul, uh, this is an office building. Uh, you sent me these photographs. Uh, and, and so it's not just something that you have to do on a grand scale. It has great effect when you do it on a small scale, right? Right, I said, I, I think that we often associate these uh, methods and procedures, we, we associate it with very large storm sewer issues and pipes, et cetera. But I think that these things, these are in the woodlands and Hughes Landing and their office buildings around the lake. And this is uh, every year they grow these grasses, probably three and four foot deep uh, within the stones. It's all, all done to, to help clarify the water as well as slow it down. Uh, I think it shows that you know, we can go examples even to our own front yards, we can put these principles in place to slow the water down and to help clean it on the way to the to the streams. Um, I think, you know, there's whether it's a strip center or apartment complex or office complexes like these, uh, it's clear when you look at these up close that the rain coming off uh, of, of these buildings and going through this basically a shield and it slows down the rocks then take it down to the to the lake itself but i think it's important to stress that it's not just the major thoroughfares and major uh bayou restoration projects or, or dams and things like that but it's also just locally we can do what we uh can do to make sure that we reserve and preserve uh pervious surfaces and uh and then help do what we can do to to uh, put the vegetation and things like that along the streams to like you said slow down and, and carry and uh maintain the, the size of those streams as well as clean the water as it goes so yeah that's i think that's these are good examples of what can be done and i think should be done as chris said just let's do it yeah, and you mentioned those impermeable surfaces. Um, parking lots would be the biggest one of those, right? Streets and parking lots, all that pavement. Water comes off of these facilities at, at up to three feet per second in, in storm events. Um, you know, there are frankly ways of doing parking lots with these uh, bioswales uh, managing the stormwater, but huge stormwater quality benefits on these. So it's not only taking uh, the solids off, but it's also taking a lot of the pollutants off. Uh, you know what happens in parking lots. You get that little oil drip from the car. Um, that is going to pollute any stormwater runoff, but there are plant materials that actually use that as nutrient uh, and prevent it from going down the stormwater system and into the bayous. Uh, it's a filter, it's a shield, like Paul said. Uh, so, you know, just here's some very simple examples of things that are in our in our area um, and th that can be done. And 
when all that water is captured and used in those areas, you can reduce your footprint for uh, the need of watering. Uh, which, which, you know, that means we got more to drink, right? That would be better. <laughs> so you start thinking about all these benefits rolled into one. And this is really what uh, green infrastructure is meant to do. Uh, it provides many layers of protection for us, but it also enhances our environment. Would you like to park in a location that maybe has some trees and provide some cover for your car? Uh, you know, or, or do you want to just have the giant sea of parking and you know, there's no respite anywhere to be found? Um, and I, I, I think that as a requirement, this would be uh, a, a great advantage to having a more attractive region, right? Because as, as I said, when what, what's the experience of driving into the parking lot of a major shopping center or your neighborhood strip center to get groceries versus how you think of it when you're driving down a tree-lined boulevard, like going through Memorial Park or something, or, or driving along uh, uh, some of the freeways where the tree pro the, the TxDOT tree program has been added. Think of those experiences and how much more pleasant it is when you've got the green next to you or that you're driving through it, or you actually get out and walk through it in a park facility that used to be just a ditch the transformation of all these is totally possible. And I think that we should be advocating more for green infrastructure being the standard, which is again, what today is all about. This whole event uh, today and tomorrow is, is let's shine a light on what can be done, why we should do it and how we can do it really well to our advantage. Um, and so once again, uh, uh, you see Gordon there uh, imploring us that uh, green is good. So let's do this. So I would like very much to uh, thank our, our, uh, our city of Houston for uh, uh, giving us the opportunity to uh, have uh, the mayor uh, say some short words. Um, every year we do this in person, uh, we, get, uh, we, we put a lot of invitations out and, and we have been lucky over the years to have a number of city officials and, and county officials, including the judge and, and commissioners and, and city council members. Uh, going virtual does have the advantage of giving us actually Mayor Sylvester Turner because uh, he can tape it uh, and not take away from his busy schedule, but he's still giving us the time uh, and I definitely want to thank him very much. Please run this short video. Hello, I'm Houston Mayor Sylvester Turner and I want to welcome you all to the first day of the Value Preservation Association's 18th annual virtual symposium with the theme green in a word is good. Over the years, the symposium has become a sought after forum among key policymakers, planners, scientists, and engineers who value the expertise presented throughout the day. About 200 individuals attend each year to learn about emerging water quality issues and to discuss possible solutions. The theme of green is good is particularly relevant when you think about the green infrastructure and resiliency goals of our city. We are future-proofing our city. In early 2021, Houston joined New Hope Housing and Star of Hope to kick off the Urban Prairie Resilience Project to transform and restore up to eight acres of undeveloped and vacant land into a native prairie. The project will advance resilient Houston goals by creating more stormwater detention, native habitat, tree plantings, and carbon capture capacity green space, while providing recreation areas for children and families. Green infrastructure is an important stormwater management tool that can enhance real estate projects while improving drainage systems performance. Creation of both the Green Stormwater Infrastructure Awards and recognition and the expedited permitting pilot programs is only the latest step in the city's goal to encourage green development. We set the precedent of recognizing and supporting the developments that have already adopted green stormwater infrastructure and resilient measures to encourage more to do the same in the future projects. Our diverse watersheds, bayous, bayou greenways, and neighborhoods are all interconnected in one way or another. The city's Bayou Greenways 2020 is still going strong with 150 miles of trails and 3,000 acres of green space 
and is a model for other cities in how to transform and connect neighborhoods around our Bayou system. Finally, Houston is the most diverse city in the nation and a vision of what our country will look like in the future. A livable, walkable, green city with a quality of life second to none. One of today's speakers is Laura Patino, the Interim Chief Resilience Officer for the City of Houston. Resilient Houston is a part of the 100 Resilient Cities Initiative. Our team is leading the charge in resilience building efforts to help Houston prepare for, withstand, and bounce back from the shocks, catastrophic events like hurricanes, floods, and cyber attacks, along with stresses like aging infrastructure, homelessness, and economic inequality. Today, you will hear how our lead agencies are moving us forward to green infrastructure. These individuals are recognized for their outstanding commitment to aiding in the conservation, preservation, restoration, or advocacy of Houston's waterways. Stewardship of our waterways is of the utmost importance. As the Bayou City, we recognize the value of Houston's defining feature by respecting bayous as an integral part of Houston's urban nature. During my tenure as mayor, I have embraced sound projects and initiatives that help protect and promote bayou conservation and preservation. These include the Adopt a Storm Drain Initiative, the Repairing and Restoration Initiative of Houston Parks and Recreation Department, the City's Resilient Houston's Plan, which I just mentioned, Green Stormwater Infrastructure Awards, and the Expedited Permitting Pilot Programs, City's Climate Action Plan, and the City's Complete Communities. I am honored to support the Bayou Preservation Association for all you do in protecting our bayous, repairing in areas, and water equality. I also want to thank the presenters for sharing invaluable knowledge, ideas, and recommendations for long-term sustainability in Houston and beyond. It really does take a village to build a great city. It really does. And I think that the mayor's remarks there are especially uh, key when you start to think about all the, the way that these pieces fit together in our community. Uh, and, and I was struck in remembering some other things uh, as he was uh, speaking there that, you know, we do have other examples of green stormwater infrastructure uh, on streets, uh, both city streets and, and county sponsored roads. Um, and, and we've learned a lot from those uh, on how we can do those better. Um, it seems that uh, we we can scale up uh, in the in the slides that I showed you. We can scale all the way up in a in a. I don't know why I didn't think of this earlier, but uh, you know projects uh, like the uh, Art Story Park uh, uh, on uh, Beltway Eight, uh, another example of green stormwater infrastructure. Um, it is simply a large detention basin for regional uh detention that has that recreation feature built into it but it's 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 enormous right it's it's a scale that's protecting a, a, a vast amount of of area in in our community and you know i think that uh, once again the mayor's remarks about it it takes a village when you think of okay we go from an individual piece of property like an office building or even a even a home uh where you can you can definitely do um uh, stormwater enhancements on your own piece of property um, all the way up to a regional detention facility, all of those pieces added together are what are going to make it possible uh, to continue to protect our region. It, it, there is no one silver bullet. I think that's something that maybe we were looking for after Harvey uh, and wondering, okay, well, why is so much of our area inundated uh, in these kind of storm events? It's not just about uh, how much water is falling out of the sky in a given hour. Uh, it has things to do with how we handle that when it hits the ground. And all of these together are what are going to uh, solve our issues. Um, there's there's no way one thing is ever going to solve all of the all the problems. Um, and so, yeah, keeping it in mind and what can you do individually? Cleaning those storm drains. He mentioned that. How many times have you seen a a clogged storm drain, or how many times have you seen uh, in a in an area drain right where you have that concrete in the, in the and it's kind of uh, angling towards that square grate in the middle of a parking lot um, and that and that grate is just filled with debris and, and trash where's the next place that trash is going to go it, it's it's heading to directly to the bayous when it hits the bayous it is going to hit Galveston Bay Galveston Bay is a fishery 
I mean, these are the things that in a green stormwater infrastructure, when you saw those parking lot examples that I showed, that debris could have been caught inside of those planting areas and simply cleaned up by a landscaping crew before it ever hits the bayou, before we have to do a trash bash and start removing tons of debris from the sides of the bayous. So all of these are things that, that we need to continue to think about and, and everyone's participation today as a speaker will illuminate more on, on different aspects of how the green infrastructure works together to solve these issues. Um, just want to call attention to a couple of the posts that have gone in. Um, Bronwyn uh, with uh, Biopreservation Association uh, on our staff uh, just promote, per, uh, put up the Adopt a Storm Drain link, uh, which is a great way uh, to um, uh, begin to understand the importance of keeping the storm drains clear uh, from debris, uh, but also how to um, get eyes on them and uh, alert uh, if, if repairs are needed uh, by the city and that adopt a storm drain program is a great way to do that. Uh, I also noticed Mary Talley is one of our, our uh, attendees today and, and that Mandolin Gardens project is, is one of her highlights and, and I appreciate her posting a picture of what it looked like before, just as I had done for the MUD 188 project. Uh, so you can see the total possibility of transforming areas of our community all around the region from what they currently are, uh, which is something that is, is an afterthought once they were constructed. We built them to handle stormwater and that was it. And then we were done with them. It doesn't have to be that way. We can build them and then actually inhabit them, use them for recreation while they continue to do their job. And that should be our standard. Again, that's what today's all about. So uh, I believe we're a little bit ahead of schedule, which is, which is uh, great because we're probably going to uh, uh, end up being on time by the end of the day. But I do know that our, our next speaker is already on board. So I think we're just going to go ahead and jump into uh, our first presentation of the day. So I would like to uh, let's go ahead and get our speaker queued up uh, back there. Uh, there I see his face. So everyone, I would like to introduce uh, Pramod Sambidi. He is a manager of socioeconomic modeling at the Houston Gaussian Area Council. Uh, HJC has been a wonderful partner in uh, uh, all of these symposiums over the years. We have uh, great participation from them on our committee, uh, but also like I mentioned before, they're the backbone of today's event. They're doing all the tech work. Um, not not promotes problem. Uh, he's here to talk about, uh, uh, yeah, regional growth, and uh, we welcome you, uh, Promote. Thank you so much for being here this morning, and uh, the floor is yours. Start us off. Thank you, Chris. Um, first of all, before I start, uh, I would like to say uh, there is no doubt uh, green is uh, good, and uh, I learned a lot uh, from Chris and Paul's presentation, short presentation. Um, there are several things that we can do to preserve our um, ecosystem. And, uh, and I also appreciate the, um, the initiatives taken by local governments and nonprofits in protecting our region. So uh, kudos to all of you guys. Um, so today uh, I'll be talking about how our region is growing and where the growth is happening. Um, and uh, this is uh, based on the census 2020 re uh, results that were released recently. I mean, last month. Um, so before before I start, before I go into the presentation, uh, I'd like to say like, why why should we care about census? Uh, so census helps in determining the uh, uh, our state representatives at the U.S. Congress. So in the last ten years, Texas added four million people and gained two House seats at the U.S. Congress. And um, census also helps in determining how much a state or a county or a city gets from federal funding. That includes emergency funding as well. And uh, it also helps in redrawing uh, political boundaries um, based on the uh, changes in the population. So that's uh, why uh, census uh, is very critical. And it is different than the, uh, the regular census estimates that we get every year. So the decennial census is the actual population count. So the, uh, it's done every 10 years. And um, <clears throat> so census uh, released the redistricting data in uh, September, which includes uh, total population by race and ethnicity, voting age population, housing units, group quarter population. And uh, all this data is available at various geographies, including the lowest geography, which is the census block. 
And more data is coming uh, in 2022 uh, related to census 2020, which includes more detailed information on age, sex, uh, race, and the household uh, relationship. Uh, and, um, and this data will be released in 2022 and census doesn't have a specific date. So it could be mostly um, mid to late uh, 2022. So before, before I, we talk about the region, uh, I want to show how our region is doing uh, in the nation. So Houston Metro is the fifth largest uh, metropolitan area in the US. And uh, it moved from sixth position in 2010 to uh, fifth position. So we crossed the Philadelphia uh, Metro. Um, and, and as you can see, uh, in terms of growth, uh, Houston is one of the three metros that uh, gained more than 1 million people in the last 10 years. And as you can see here, uh, Houston, Dallas, and New York are, are the only three metropolitan areas which gain more than 1 million. And uh, Houston ranks three in the growth. And uh, we did beat Dallas in terms of percentage growth though. And uh, as you can see, other uh, metros in our region, uh, San Antonio and Austin also have increasing population and Austin has a 33% uh, growth. And this is in terms of just cities. And as you can see, uh, Houston is the fourth largest city in the US and uh, it is getting closer to Chicago. Um, and as you can see, our growth percentage is significant compared to Chicago. And it is possible that in the next 10 years, by the next, when the next census will be released in 2030, we may close the gap with Chicago or we may overtake Chicago. That, that's a possibility. So here, this data is for uh, the 13 county region uh, for the Houston Galveston area, which includes Harris and surrounding areas, as well as five rural uh, counties. So uh, we have been gaining population since the uh, last two decades. As you can see, we added 1.2 million people in each of the last two decades. And right now, our population is close to 7.3 million people. So that's a tremendous growth. Uh, and here are the counties uh, that are, I mentioned, the 13 counties. And as you can see, uh, Harris County um, added 638,000 people, uh, which accounted for 53% of the region's growth. And the 47% of the region's growth is uh, uh, accounted by the 12 counties. And uh, there are two counties in our region that are also losing population, some of the rural counties like Matagorda and uh, Colorado. Um, th these are the uh, uh, list of top um, cities that added at least uh, 2,000 people in the last 10 years. And as you can see, Houston tops the list with 205,000 people. Uh, however, uh, I would also like to focus on some of the suburban cities that are seeing a dramatic growth. And for example, full share uh, population has gone from 1,000 to 16,000 or 17,000 with a percentage growth of uh, 1,386, as well as Iowa Colony, Manuel, Mont Bellevue, all these cities have seen a significant growth, including Conroe, uh, uh, which has seen 60% uh, growth. So our region is growing and growth is happening everywhere. And um, if we imagine our region as uh, rings, so it is uh, the Loop, the Beltway 8, the Grand Parkway, and this is the uh, eight county uh, MPO region and the five rural counties club together. You can see that the area between Beltway 8 and Grand Parkway accounted for 51% of the growth um, the la in the last 10 years. And uh, the area between Beltway 8 and the eight, eight county region added 35%. Uh, so that's a tremendous growth. And uh, in terms of uh, urban area, you can see that uh, the area inside the inside Beltway 8 accounted for 15% if you combine them. And rural counties only ac accounted for 1% of the growth. And here is the same uh, data for, but historic. And as you can see, um, there's not much change in the population of the inner loop, uh, which is dark blue bar, and not much change in the, uh, the rural counties, which is the light blue bar. But the bun in the gray, which is the belt area between Beltway and Grand Parkway, has, which is the gray bar, has 
seen a significant growth over the last few decades. And similarly, the area between Grand Parkway and uh, the eight county MPO region has also seen seeing a significant growth with a, these yellow bars here. So that uh, the, the, the region is basically expanding. And um, some may think like uh, we have seen a lot of uh, redevelopment happening in the inside the loop and inside Beltway, there are a lot of multifamilies. Yes, there are a lot of multifamilies, but if you look at the uh, change in housing units and change in population in the last 10 years and calculate the population per housing unit, you can see that uh, most of the um, uh, people that are living in, inside the loop are mostly one person or two person households uh, and they're young adults who prefer to locate uh, close to their workplace. So that's why um, you see uh, the population per housing unit is uh, lower, whereas population per housing unit in uh, outside the Grand Parkway, outside Beltway 8 is high, meaning that people with children prefer to live uh, in the suburbs. And similarly, rural counties also have a lower population per housing unit because this is, would be mostly related to uh, senior citizens. Uh, so this map here tells you exactly where the growth has happened in the last 10 years. And this is a, each grid is nine square miles and the dark grids, which are in red color, uh, have population over 10,000. So as you can see the area along the uh, Grand Parkway, the West and the Northwest have seen a tremendous growth in, in the last 10 years, as well as uh, in, in some portion in the North. And um, we also see some uh, uh, development, uh, redevelopment like multifamilies uh, growth happening inside the urban core as well. But there are areas, some areas in the, in, the, in the urban area that are losing population as well. And here is the uh, race and ethnicity. Our region is becoming more and more diverse. Uh, as you can see, uh, the Anglo uh, share has gone from 40% to 34%. And the Hispanic, uh, Hispanic share has gone from uh, 35 per, gone up from 35% to 37%, as well as the Asian population, Asian share has gone from uh, six to 8%. And um, also uh, to make a note that uh, Fort Bend County, one of, uh, one of the counties in our region is one of the most diversified counties, not only in Texas, but in the US as well, which has all major, um, race and ethnicities uh, with a share of more than 20%. So that's, um, it's, it's, it's the most diversified uh, county. And in terms of uh, population, so these census release doesn't include the age breakdown. The only breakdown we have is the population 18 years and over, which is the voting age population. And if you look at the voting age population, uh, it has gone up a little from 72% to 74%. That's uh, indicating that we have senior uh, people, I mean, uh, senior citizens growing and uh, our um, young uh, school age uh, percentage gone uh, down from 28% to 26%. And here is a group for information, group for is people living in prisons and dormitories or nursing homes. And as you can see, the good news is the uh, population in the uh, correctional institutions and juvenile facilities has gone down from 2010 to 2020, uh, and um, the population in the dormitories has gone up. And the only concern with the uh, is the nursing homes. You can see the nursing home uh, population has gone up from 13,000 to 17,000, indicating that we have more senior citizens uh, or senior people um, um, because of the baby boom. Uh, we have senior citizens that we need to take care of. Uh, as part of the Census 2020, we also developed a tool uh, which summarizes data for various geographies. Uh, I'm going to kind of quickly do a short demo of that. So here is our tool space. Uh, I have the links at the end on the last slide. And here is our uh, demographic Census 2020 tool. And uh, We'll try to quickly go over it. I'm not going to cover everything here. Um, so here is a snapshot of our region. This is the 13 county region I mentioned. And here is the population for our 13 county region. And you can uh, look at the historic growth. You can also look at the housing units 
the group quarter population, the voting age population. And um, you can also look at the, the, uh, the race and ethnicity breakdown, as well as the historical uh, race and ethnicity from 2000 to 2020. Um, and similarly, you can look at the age composition, the group quarter composition and occupancy status. And here, uh, if you want uh, data for a specific county, you can simply use this tool. And uh, for example, if I want Brazoria County here, uh, the, all this data will be updated for Brazoria County. Um, similarly, um, we have data for cities. So if you are interested in a particular city, uh, you can just go here, click on the drop down. You can select any city here. Let me select Alvin, for example. Uh, you can see this is the Allen data that you're looking at. Uh, so this is, this is uh, and, uh, and also we have data for the independent school districts, congressional districts, and voting districts and tracks. And one last thing I would like to show is um, the advanced tool, which has all this data again. But the cool thing with this is you can uh, summarize data for a user-defined geography. So... For example, I don't have the watershed boundaries here, but I can add data here by clicking on this blue widget. And when I do, uh, for example, Harris County watersheds. So here uh, I see the Harris County flood control districts has watersheds. So let me add them here. So I you can see the watersheds here, and uh, let me let me pick one uh, by here. So once once you click on it, uh, you see the three dots here. You can click on them and set location. And once you set location, so this is Winds Bayou, um, and you can see the data is summarized for this bayou using the census block, which is the lowest geography. And you can see the total population, household population, housing units. And uh, you can also look at the age breakdown by race and ethnicity. Uh, and the good thing is you can also download the data. You, you click on this cloud button here, you can download the data as in a spreadsheet format and you can open it. And uh, you'll see the, uh, the census block data and all this information. So that's the tool. Um, let me go back to the tool. And uh, there, is, there is a user guide, uh, there is definitions and all, all the additional information is there. And if you have any questions, you can, uh, you can always reach out to us. And let me go back to the slide. And uh, here is the link to that application that I sh just showed. And there are also links to some Excel and PDF tables uh, if you are interested in. You can click on this link. And here is our uh, contact information. So that's all I have to share today. Uh, and let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Promote, thank you very much. That was great. Uh, this tool is amazing. Um, what was the impetus for the creation of the tool? Um, was there a specific branch of HGAC that needed to look at data in a different way, or um, is, is it broader than that? Where, where did where did the uh, idea come from? Um, so we do, uh, this is this is not the first tool we developed. We have a lot of uh, other tools, uh, as you can see here. These are all the tools we developed. And uh, HGAC, so our, my group basically serves the, uh, provide data assistance to local governments, nonprofits, public and businesses. So um, over the last five years, there has been a significant improvement in the uh, technology. So previously we used to serve data requests by providing like spreadsheet like tables or, or, or PDFs. And once we get this um, technology like RGIs online and Tableau and several tools, so we started putting data to, uh, on the tools so that people can easily access them from anywhere. Uh, they don't have to, like, I mean, um, we'll still serve them, but they, they don't have to contact. They can go to this site and directly get all that information. And, and there is no uh, GIS experience needed or there is no, it's just like browsing any, uh, any um, your like a browser, Chrome or, or, or Safari. So 
it's that uh, simple. And we we all always uh, provide a user guide for each of our uh, tool. And, and some of them also have video tutorials. And we do provide training as well if needed. What kind of updates? Uh, how, how often is the information uh, updated to uh, state? So, so depending on the depending on the data. Um, so, for example, we have this uh, demographic snapshot um, uh, here somewhere. Um, so we have the like demographic snapshot, which is updated uh, here, uh, which is updated annually based on the American Community Survey. So the the data is released in December uh, of every year, and we try to update that uh, in December or early January. And similarly, for example, we have um, crash data. Crash data is updated annually. So depending on the data source, if the data source is produced every year, we try to update it every year. Uh, there was a question about, uh, does uh, do you have a, an ability to look at changes in income levels, uh, also education and occupation? Um, is that, uh, are those are those tabs that y'all track also? Um, I mean, we do have um, uh, we do have data on uh, uh, the, the snapshot that I showed uh, here, uh, the demographic snapshot, and there is a demographic data explorer. Uh, so there are there are tools that uh, includes those um, uh, income, and they, they, we also have a tool on occupation, so people can like go to the site and, and, and check it out. And if they don't find any information, they can reach out to us and we'll, we can guide them. All right. You mentioned how important this is uh, that, that uh, we, we've gained some seats, <laughs> some representation. Right. Um, right. How important it would, I mean, I, I think that in general, people understand that importance and yet we see such lower voter turnout rates. Um, what what can these tools teach us about why we vote the way we vote or where the, that voting uh, occurs? Uh, because the growth of the region, as, as you demonstrated, uh, approaching, we're already in the top five, this is only gonna get, you know, uh, we're only gonna increase in population, which, you know, much to the chagrin of, of the outlying counties, you know, right? The, these outlying counties are experiencing the same kind of urbanism urbanism that's happened in Harris County for for many decades now as this as this continues like dropping a rock in a pond the, the waves are continuing to go out uh, how important is it to track this kind of information to understand where voters are are voting from and and how we can increase our rep representation in the area right so I mean uh, that's why uh, like when census starts it's uh, like the start um, sending the surveys it it does its uh, like uh, outreach two years ahead, like like almost like 2018. It started in 2018. It, it is encouraging people to vote, so that I mean, uh, encouraging people to fill out the survey so that they are they can be represented by the state their state officials. So that is very important. Uh, and and if if, the, if uh, census is not counting people, then it uh, our population total will be less, and we'll have less representative. So. Um, and 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 uh, once once the census is released, um, it will help in redefining the boundaries uh, because uh, each house district uh, tends to uh, have the similar population. So if if one of the uh, house district has a, has shown a significant increase in population, then it will be subject to redrawing because uh, so that it matches with the other other house district. So so that the population is almost almost the same across the house district. That's the reason they're saying uh, Texas gained two seats. That's because of this uh, increase in population. So um, yeah, and 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 in in terms of growth, growth is always good, and um, we also make sure we need to make sure that uh, while we are growing, we also need to protect our ecosystem. So um, uh, our as 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 a regional uh, local government HGS is also like uh, looking into these when we are doing transportation planning and stuff. We are uh, also considering the ecosystem. That's why you can see uh, we kind of developed some tools for that for particular purposes, the ecological and the regional conservation. Uh, so all these tools are aimed to kind of, kind of conserve our regional ecosystem and at the same time um, develop the infrastructure for the for the uh, to accommodate the growth. 
Yeah, and you, and you demonstrated those uh, watershed overlays. Um, and uh, what are some other tools? And uh, would you be willing to demonstrate real quick what what's in the ecological GIS? So I see that tab there. Um, so yeah. So here we have the original uh, uh, like ecological layers. So if you look at this, so this is our uh, land cover data. So we develop land cover in-house. Um, so the, uh, we, we try to develop it every two years. So we, this is the 2020 land cover that you're seeing. And uh, uh, like we estimate the different land covers for our region. And then um, kind of we also look at the, um, you can also look at the, um, there's an ecotype. So basically uh, the green areas are the, the ones with the high ecotype. And, and uh, if you want, you can look also look at different um, like parcels. Basically, if you want to, if you want to identify parcels with where 80% of the um, area is ecological area, then you can, you can pick uh, these layers as well. So there's a lot of information in them. Um, it's um, probably needs a, another presentation on this so but but yeah i mean uh, there there this data this is mainly and also it includes um, uh, the, the the red flag the red flag indicator uh, which includes um, like uh, airport facilities uh, cemeteries managed lands recreational brownfields super super fun sites so all this information is also available on this tool so if you are doing it, if you are trying to, uh, I mean, this is mainly for our transportation planning. So if, if they are planning on developing a road somewhere in the in the region, then uh, they can use this tool to identify how much the ecosystem is impacted, or or what are the uh, underlying um, like the, the the red flag indicators basically, and and it helps them to guide either modify the modify the road or do something to so that the eco ecosystem is preserved. That's fantastic. This is a, a wonderful tool. I'm getting those comments repeatedly uh, on, on the chat. Um, so a question just came in. Uh, let's see. How do we protect the ecosystem from trees being cut down to build homes uh, close to property lines? Maybe the three foot building code to 10 feet to put in sustainable drain systems. Um, that's that's an interesting question. I'm not sure whether uh, promote you. Have, you're that's welcome to say an opinion on that. I certainly have an opinion. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, I, I think that I think that that is something that we have discussed in the way that we have treated uh, to answer uh, the the question. I think that's that's something that that we have treated our bayous and our drainage ways as simply something that gets the water off, like it's a bad thing. Let's get this stuff off of our property as quickly as possible, um, and and. I think what we have, what we have learned recently, uh, and uh, through actual data acquisition, is that you know when you clear land uh, for any purpose, uh, we're not talking about clearing it and building a parking lot. I'm talking about clearing it, getting rid of the the species that were already there. Um, the the runoff increases dramatically, and so having you know something like uh, larger or or changing the distance on on uh, you know for building codes would would allow sites to you know maybe keep a little bit but there's so much that has to be done uh regulation wise in development of of new communities um you know whether it's something for for suburban developments uh, subdivisions for for uh, individual homes or whether you're talking about commercial tracts uh or or even freeways as Pramod was just mentioning about the you know designing for freeways and where should they go where should the local infrastructure be placed uh so that it doesn't get flooded um you know I think that we have uh, very few of uh, very few of our uh, the, the tree regulations are going to happen at a, at a more local level uh, than than a regional level. You, you'll you'll only get the tree regulations from a regional standpoint when you have a protected forest, right? Um, which, which is one of the buttons I saw on on uh, Promote's uh, uh, GIS app. Um, but I think it's the local jurisdictions that have the the most effect on you know trees on whether there are protections in place for existing species or whether they require replacement of trees uh, for so many square foot of development. And it is uh, not a consistently applied um, 
uh, code of any kind, you know, across the region. It's so different in so many areas. And so I, I think that that's a good, that's a great question to uh, to focus on and, and something that we uh, on the on the symposium committee take notes on that maybe that's something that we should look at in in the future. Um, we did a couple of years ago. We we did an entire symposium on on the land on dirt. Like literally, that was our our focus for the day. Uh, and so I think the trees is something that we should maybe take a look at. So um, uh, yeah, great question uh, from the audience there. Um, Yes, and the same same person is replying about talking to to cities about the building codes, and I think that is that, that's where that really lies. Um, your your map there, promote uh, to finish up. I think that uh, you know we have we have have talked about the the biodiversity in in our region, and the and in the mayor's remarks talking about you know not only the biodiversity but the diversity of our communities. It, it's really interesting, and we talked I, I, actually this was last year's symposium. We talked about. Uh, how the diversity of the community, the diversity of our land areas kind of go hand in hand. Um, did you all notice when you were putting together this, this application uh, of when, when you overlaid things, uh, is there any kind of correlations that y'all could draw with that? Yeah, I mean, um, so we, we, we did look at, uh, as, as I said, like we were doing the land core data um, um, historically. I mean, we do have historical land core data. And, and yeah, when we overlaid, we are, we are seeing, I mean, some of the, some of the green infrastructure being redeveloped into like single family homes and stuff. So, and, and, and I, I guess there are, there are only very few uh, areas that are well protected and, and uh, cannot be, cannot be developed, but, but we, we have been seeing uh, growth happening, like our region is sprawling a, a lot. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, and do you see that the network of uh, of, of infrastructure, either you know, from a street standpoint, from a, a, a drainage in, uh, standpoint, um, are those being adequately addressed as we continue out? Because when you look at the urban area, you can kind right. of see those things really well. But maybe in as we as we uh, continue to move outward from from the Harris County core into the, right. in the surrounding counties, can you see that infrastructure, or is that something that's lacking? And this is a great tool to to look at that. So yeah, I mean, uh, we uh, recently, uh, my team also did the, the, the resiliency study for the uh, federal highways. So what we did was we looked at our regional uh, transportation assets, which are the roadway segments in our region, and we looked at how vulnerable they are for flooding. So we, we looked at different uh, scenarios like final year, 100 year event, uh, Harvey, Ike, and, and we have identified uh, the vulnerable roadway segments in our region, and they're not just in Houston, but they are in across our region. So we have identified them and we have, um, so that that particular study will be uh, taken as an input uh, into the future when we are uh, uh, funding uh, tra funding uh, transportation projects for improvements or for mitigation. So those those uh, results will be uh, taken into consideration and, and, and the projects are the roadway segment that needs to be uh, improved based on Repeated flooding will be uh, will be uh, probably selected. Yes, that's a good question. Thank you. Yeah, that 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 is interesting. That gets factored into uh, where monies are are allocated, uh, and so that, that goes directly into the TIP program, right? Correct. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, excellent, uh, Promote. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation. Everyone is uh, responding about how great this tool is. Uh, and so uh, I want to thank you very much for your, your participation this morning. Thanks for coming into the symposium. We welcome you. I know this is your first time, so uh, you did great. We really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So we're going to, uh, we're going to move on next. Our, our next speaker, uh, Luis Guajardo who is the Urban Policy Research Manager at the Kinder Institute. Um, Luis is also a, uh, a planner, uh, as am I. And so, uh, and, and he's a, a director elect of the American Planning Association, the Houston uh, section. And so uh, I appreciate that very much. Uh, you're, you're, uh, you're doing the, the good work. Uh, I've done some of that work in my past and I know what that's like. So glad to have you on board. And um, we've had Kinder on many times in the past uh, talking about the, the demographics uh, 
uh, research, y'all y'all do the uh, uh, the survey, um, which has just become a staple of information about how our region has grown. Um, you know, our previous speaker was just talking about um, you know some of those facts and figures from from the actual um, you know population, and and that GIS, GIS tool is amazing. But uh, the Kinder Research Institute um, th that that information uh, it. it I don't. I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to eloquently describe it. Maybe you can, Luis. But um, you're actually here today. We're gonna. You're gonna touch a little bit on that, but you're gonna transform that information into into a little bit uh, a different way of thinking about it. And and uh, coming from the planning perspective, I'm really interested. And in, we're gonna have a lot of follow up questions. I know, but um, uh, I see you're muted. If you unmute yourself, I'm gonna give you the floor. And and uh, everyone, please welcome Luis. Thanks, Chris. Thank you so much. Um, can can you hear me loud and clear? You're very good. Thank you. Great. I'm going to now let me get my screen set up and just confirm that everything is working. Um, just let me know. All right. Does is this coming through? Not yet. Not yet. All right. Let's see. All right. How about now? There you go. Perfect. OK. Um, sorry, let me get something else set up here on the back end. All right. That's not the slide. There it is. So thank you for having us today. I, you know, I'm, I'm thank you to the Bioproservation Association for the invite. Uh, as you said, we're, uh, we, we've been here before and we've covered a lot of what's in the Kinder Houston Area Survey. Um, today, I'm really excited to, to come here and, and bring a slightly, not, not an entirely different perspective, but bring a little bit of a different stream of our work that we're doing here at Kinder um, to talk about the subject of green is good. Uh, we've been we've been involved in a number of different efforts, uh, including a lot on the housing side of late, but we've also were involved in Resilient Houston um, as a part of the project team helping the city uh, and have been undertaking some work recently with Harris County on looking at the effects of Winter Storm Uri um, as well. There will be a forthcoming report uh, later this year on that. Um, and so I'll be able to share a little bit of that, but I also wanted to add and bring in some of our housing work to set the stage too for what we're seeing in demographics and specifically on the housing need within uh, both Houston and Harris County specifically uh, to take a little bit of a more targeted view at uh, some of what Promote, Pr Promote was presenting uh, earlier. To, to us, this is really, you know, it's just an important topic of discussion and how do we build, you know, on all the different infrastructure investments that are going on? We, we're kind of in this moment after Hurricane Harvey, it felt like really everyone brought their best, you know, to the, to the table. We've seen some incredible studies done here by uh, the Flood Mitigation Consortium, um, a number of different organizations and institutes and nonprofits really coming together and trying to solve and understand what is happening, right? And what can we do around this, uh, around the effort um, to, to meet the needs of, of, the, uh, of today and tomorrow, and also ensure that we are uh, protecting uh, life uh, here in the, in the, in the region. Um, and so, you know, when we're thinking about uh, this, this topic, you know, how, what better way than relying on our natural systems, right? We, we, we know we have some exceptional engineering talent in, in the Houston area, amazing designers as well from, from all over the world work here, uh, even though we don't have uh, like, a, we don't have a landscape architecture school here, but we do have some incredible landscape architects practicing here along with civil engineers that are very, very talented. And we are known as, as one of the engineering capitals in the US, if not the, um, the engineering capital in the US. But relying on our natural systems is, uh, has been largely an untapped area. So I'm really excited for a lot of the work that is that is picked up after Harvey and thinking about how do we build on a lot of that infrastructure, the gray infrastructure that we're building? How do we put you know safeguards in front of it? How do we slow waters down even before it, you know, it gets to that infrastructure? And also just to protect the investments that we're making in this gray, in this gray, on the gray side of things, right? Um, and, um, but the other thing here is that I'm going to get into at the kind of closer to the end is how do we also get, you know, um, 
what are some ways that we might be able to get more people involved at the household level, right? And, and so thinking about those kinds of questions, um, you know, leveraging a lot of the heavy rain and, and what can we do around more water capturing um, to be also to sustain future droughts and drier seasons. So there's, I think there's a lot of work in this space that's that's been going on. Um, so again, today I'm gonna go ahead and cover um, some of, so starting off with some of the housing implications of what we're seeing, because I think a lot of this will have, give us a little bit of, a, of an understanding of um, what this means for the type of communities that we plan and the types of needs that we're gonna have over the next decade, and then we'll transition into some of the green infrastructure talk. So let's kind of start here with, um, I'm gonna just communicate a little bit of the affordability challenges. So we've we've been here at the Kinder Institute, we've also been undergoing the, um, the annual state of housing reports, which is a, it's a, a, a new initiative. It's been around for a couple of years now, but we're, we're doing an annual update on indicators. Uh, for the most part, what you'll see here is, is uh, one year Census Bureau estimates comparing from one year to the next. So in our latest report, um, the one thing that really startled us was what we're calling this affordability gap. And I'm gonna highlight it. Can you all see my, my mouse on the screen? I'm gonna assume that's a yes, but let me know. Yes, we can. Answer. So the affordability gap specifically here for renters, uh, it's a $94,000, $95,000 gap, meaning the, the median renter, based on the median income, a renter can afford a home of $135,000 on the market if they were paying 30% of their income on housing. Uh, but the median sales price in, in, the, in the county uh, is closer to 235,000 to 34,000. And so that gap is $95,000. And that gap over the last 10 years, I didn't have a graphic for this, but from the prior report, we've, we have the data. Um, and that gap used to be $30,000 in 2010, just coming out of the Great Recession. Uh, that has tripled um, since the last decade and is really um, creating a different dynamic and a different reality for owners and, and for and for renters in the last decade. So that's an important um, statistic to keep in mind as we think about who is having access and why is our why are why is our home ownership rate going down uh, in the county and in the city. We also know that low income renters are, are especially squeezed um, and you're seeing what you see on the left part of this is this is the cost burden or meaning Households that are paying more than 30% of their income on housing is in, is in uh, blue. Uh, and then households that are paying in more than 50% or they're extremely cost burdened, severely cost burdened, that's in orange, um, and by income band. And what you can see here is that households, uh, even up to, so it's, it's not surprising that this is a, a, a very stark need at the bottom end of the spectrum. This is about, um, $20,000 equals about what we know to be 30% of the county's median income and uh, $35,000 represents about half or close to 60% of the county's median income. Uh, $50,000 represents about 80% of the county's median income. So it, it's not surprising to see this uh, at the bottom end of the spectrum. This is pretty much uh, known throughout almost every metropolitan area. In, in America, um, but we also are seeing this tightening even coming up to this income band of the 60 to 80% of the median income. We're seeing uh, more than half of renters squeezed at that income bracket. Uh, and that's, that's increased significantly also in the last decade, uh, which is again, a concern in, in, in who, who has access um, to the affordable housing supply in this region. A part of this is just this reality that we've dealt with and, and the pandemic really kind of um, exposed a lot of this too, but Hearst County for a while has been a national leader in evictions. We've been behind New York City and maybe I think Phoenix, Arizona, we're kind of floating in that second and third ranking. Um, but um, these are some very startling numbers and the spatial dynamics of this are also a bit maybe counterintuitive. Uh, so we're, we're seeing the biggest eviction or the highest eviction rates um, 
is closer to the Beltway areas and beyond. So we're seeing a lot in, in obviously in Southwest Houston, near Gulfton, but also um, the Bel Air corridor, uh, Westwood, uh, the 45 corridor in Pasadena, uh, Baytown, and then up north along 45 and Greens Point. So a lot of this is not necessarily a very urban problem. It's starting to become a much more suburbanized, or I wouldn't say suburbanized problem, but it's much more of an inner suburban or it's a ring problem. Uh, these communities are the most um, uh, aren't the ones that we might think of as seeing the highest eviction rates, uh, but in fact, that's where we're seeing that. And a lot of this has implications for, you know, who, um, where folks are in the income band that are looking for for housing. Um, and so if you're on the lower income end of the spectrum, you're really just trying to stay sheltered and housed, and you're not really thinking and concerned about, you know, economic mobility, perhaps like you know, breaking out of po breaking out of poverty is a much more um, tougher situation for folks. And that that has consequences for our economy as well. Um, these are some preliminary findings that, that I'm sharing here. Kinder is also leading the Harris County Housing Study, which is known as the My Home is Here initiative, and it will be out um, at the end of this month in October. Um, but a, a, big pro, a big problem of why folks are also cost burdened has a lot to do with, with the supply and demand of homes. And so th this is market data that we've compiled through this study. We're seeing that a lot of there's a lot of shortages down on the bottom end of the spectrum. So we know we have a, a pretty stark demand for uh, affordable housing that's affordable to folks under $20,000 a year, but there's just no supply at that level. So a lot of those households are coming up and uh, renting at higher rates into uh, supply that is uh, that we actually are doing pretty well on. It's the supply of 30 to 60 percent of median household income, so affordable to families earning between 20 and 35 thousand dollars a year. Uh, but a lot of that is being taken by uh, lower income households who have no other homes uh, to go to. And then this causes kind of an, an upward effect, right? And and the one area where we're really good at here in Harris County is um, this 60 to 80 percent workforce housing. Um, area that that's been largely met by the market and uh, a relative success story compared to a lot of other cities and counties throughout the throughout urban America. Um, however, a lot of this is also being taken um, by lower income households who are now kind of compressing and coming up into this in, into this level and, and, and absorbing some of that supply. We're also seeing some compressing coming from above the 120 median household income, which is about $75,000 in Harris County. Uh, and above, right? So a lot of that, um, there is some supply there, but it's um, they're certainly also coming down. So we're seeing a really compressing of this great supply that we've built up, but we've there's this mismatch between demand and supply that I think you you all be will be seeing more of as the study is rolled out. Um, but a big concern going forward. And promote promote kind of touched on this a little bit um, during his conversation, but one thing we looked at is in the state of housing report, we looked at a year to year change from 2018 to 2019. And while Houston has certainly been increasing in population in the county also over the last decade, we did observe, and these are one year estimates, so there could be some slight um, sampling errors here, but from the 2018 to the 2019 census data, uh, ACS estimates, we did notice a drop in population in the city of Houston for the first time um, on an annual basis. So I think we'd have, we'd have to look out for that number uh, over the long term and see if that self-corrects. But this drop in population coincided with a 30,000 household increase in Houston. So as Promote was saying, the household sizes in the city are, you know, you're seeing a lot of sing single people moving in, people living alone or rooming with just one other person. And so very small households. Uh, so even though we gained 30,000 households in Houston, uh, you can see here this, these two blue chart, these two blue uh, bars in the bottom, uh, we lost population nearly of 10,000. Um, so again, that's something to keep out, keep looking out for. And when we looked at the household dynamics uh, or the household composition, we see specifically if you go down to the Houston level here at the bottom, uh, this orange um, bar represents those that are living alone. That's where we did see again the, a big increase there. 
as well as uh, a slight increase in those that are rooming together in this blue number. Um, but really, that that these numbers are were quite a surprise to us in terms of their their impact. So again, Houston increased in the last decade in population, but in the last couple of years, it, it looked like that trend might be changing. Um, now, again, going back to the study, um, we're also we kind of looked at this separately. But what are we what are we seeing in terms of of regional growth projections? Um, and then boxing that in within Harris County, uh, we know that we have uh, jobs projected, and we from that we were able to analyze the type of household growth that is going to occur in Harris County, and so. Um, what we know is that we're going to continue to see uh, a pretty big growth in, in new households that are under 30% of median household income, a uh, substantial amount of growth in the 30 to 60 range, um, and not enough supply there. As you can see, we also don't have any supply of the under 30, uh, virtually almost no supply in the market under 30% of, of AMI. Um, we have some pretty sizable supply in the in the 60 to 80 that's still out there. Um, I, even with COVID, we still have some pretty substantial uh, housing out there, and the demand is not that not that high in this category. Um, where we are seeing also some other shortages on the 80 to 120 percent of AMI, so income ranges of uh, about fifty thousand dollars to seventy five thousand dollars a year. So really, shortages are projected across the board and there's gonna to have to really be concerted effort in the county uh, with different entities on how to, how to resolve this and, and pursuing housing at different income levels. Uh, there will be more in the study about recommendations on how you get there. But um, some of that also just underpins a lot of, uh, it's important to understand also where a lot of those strategies are gonna be dealt with and where we're gonna build that housing and that relationship to the natural environment and um, and, uh, and, and the ecological systems around us. So one thing you'll find in the My Home is Here study is we did a comprehensive land suitability analysis with the University of Texas, um, where we've brought in environmental constraints and really are flagging areas in the county that are suitable for future home housing production and areas that we shouldn't be, that should be avoided um, based on environmental risk factors. And so you'll see a lot of that analysis in the final report. Um, and, and one to, I think one that this group would really um, be really keen on. Um, from our state of housing, we also, I, I kind of wanted to close out some of this housing aspects by closing with what we're seeing in the vulnerability within the floodplain, right? I think this is changing in terms of the definition of the floodplain, but from the way we looked at this uh, earlier in the year, uh, we know that um, one in four homes are located right now in, in within the 500 year floodplain or the 100 year or the floodway. Um, we know that we have about $30 billion worth of residential property uh, within those within the, the three here uh, as well. And that's a pretty substantial amount of, of uh, tax dollars that are, that are at risk. But the really most concerning part here and the one that's troubling, uh, it's troubling, but it's also hard to get at is how do we um, deal with the lack of flood insurance? And, and many, in many cases, you're dealing with, um, you know, cost burden is already pretty high, depending on where you are in the, in the, in the income bracket. Uh, there's just a lot of uh, household expenses right now as well that families are dealing with. If you're a newer family, you're dealing with student loans and potentially childcare costs that are pretty exorbitant. Um, and so flood insurance is, is really, um, I'm not saying that it's an afterthought, but we're, we are surprised by just how low um, we, looking at the data, we know that there's, um, that it's hard to separate where the floodplains are geographically. We kind of have tried to look at that, but what we do know is that we have four units in the floodplain to every flood insurance policy countywide, right? And so th just that ratio alone is pretty stark. We can't get the exact number within the floodplain of flood insurance policies, but just that, again, that number to us is pretty stark. And so we think that, um, you know, if there's really here, um, you know, th this means that there's a massive amount of residential wealth that is really vulnerable to washing away in the next storm. And this can really, 
you know, the, the implications of this are, are pretty dire. Uh, we went through it already. We've gone through it several times in the last decade, uh, but we're going to continue to go through this if it goes unaddressed, right? Um, you know, now I kind of, I want to pivot a little bit into, you know, the, those are some big housing concerns and they, they're they very related to our natural and green systems and why we're doing the work that we're doing, right, from a lot of our different organizations. Uh, so we do salute a lot of the hard work you're doing. And I think it's a, it's fantastic that we've been really trying to solve these challenges. Um, but greening cities is, is not a new phenomenon, right? And we're talking today about green being good. Uh, this has been talked about for many decades uh, in, within the context of American cities. Uh, and I think that there's a lot we can, we can try to learn from prior efforts um, to understand a little bit of our puzzle today. And so, you know, we, we know um, the industrial era just really uh, dramatically changed cities. We saw, uh, you know, 11 million Americans migrating from rural to urban communities uh, during the industrial era, during the, mostly from the 1870s to 1920s. <clears throat> we also know that a, a, an overwhelming majority of the 25 million immigrants who came to the US during that time period also settled in cities as they were um, seeking out um, work in the factory. Uh, this really created a lot of, of what we, uh, of, of that industrial uh, kind of gravitas that the United States was, was known for. But it also brought with it a lot of uh, really severe um, unsanitary housing conditions and disease. Uh, you know, most of most of these uh, new urbanites found themselves living in, you know, in, in often uh, poorly lit, cramped, uh, underventilated homes, uh, with, in most cases, without any indoor plumbing. Um, a lot of these housing tenements were really, uh, you know, hotbeds of, of vermin and disease. And a lot of the issues we were dealing with at the time were cholera, typhus, tuberculosis. Um, and there was this really incredible photo essay published in 1890 by Jacob Rees called on um, Where the Other Half Lives of New York. And he really did a tremendous job in, depict, in, in capturing a lot of the squalid living conditions in New York and, and really made it mainstream and just kind of shared it with, with a lot of the world that hadn't really quite seen, specifically the wealthier uh, Americans who hadn't quite seen what was really going on in, in a lot of the housing stock at the time. Um, we've, we've also had some really interesting um, uh, evolution around case law as you started to see kind of this kind of conflicting uh, challenges between industrial land uses and residential land uses. Uh, American constitutional law really um, affirms the role of, of state governments to regulate the behavior and enforce order within their territory for the betterment of the health, safety, and general welfare of the population, uh, otherwise known as it's as the police authority or the police power. And much of this land use authority um, was delegated to cities and counties. And that really created a lot of the dawn of cities trying to plan and bring in a lot of legal expertise to how they set land use uh, arrangements in accordance with this case law. Um, and we also saw cities really beginning to adapt their management structures in response to a lot of this. Um, so um, they took a page out of the corporate uh, conglomerates at the time and really were trying to eliminate waste and inefficiencies in city management. Um, and a lot of what went on during that early 20th century really shaped the way that we know city management to be today to have um, kind of these these uh, management structures that in a way mirrored a lot of the innovations that were happening within corporate America uh, at the time in industrial uh, America. But some of those um, opportunities were, you know, kind of against that back backdrop, you see these, not, not just those improvements in management styles, but you see greening concepts emerged in the way that cities were planned and designed. We, we kind of went through this garden city phase, uh, which was uh, really about bringing more natural systems and green life uh, and, and bringing the, the uh, kind of the agricultural um, aspects of, um, of our communities near cities, especially as thinkers of the time were, were concerned about rural depopulation and the destabilization of, of that kind of traditional mode of, of life that was so known prior to that mass 
urban migration. Um, and so we see that, we see the evolution of parkways, which were really um, these kind of strands that were you know, used with, with more kind of active recreation and serving as kind of those urban lungs as, as a contact, you know, to kind of contrast a lot of that industrial uh, growth situation and really trying to connect green spaces in the city to provide respite from, from those elements. Um, but this had more active recreation thought um, behind it as well. So they were really considered more parkways, a couple examples here. Um, I've also kind of taken the liberty of classifying where I kind of feel like the Houston Bayou Greenways fits in here. Um, that to me, they really resemble a lot more the parkway situation. Uh, we saw green belts in the UK really pick up as well. This is more passive green space, but a way to contain growth of the city and preserve a lot of what the, those values in the in the countryside of, of uh, of the UK and there was some amazing uh, planning efforts done around that. And, and that's been quite um, uh, an iconic um, planning system in, in the UK that even to today, it's been quite contested in terms of opening up those areas for development. Um, and then we've seen greenways, which are, they can be a lot more, um, they're, they're potentially smaller than parkways, but also serve uh, connectivity. And the Houston's Beyond the Bayou initiatives, to me, represents a lot of what those greenways can be. They, they're, they're, they, can, they can resemble a parkway, but they can also be, you know, use traditional rights of way like streets and sidewalks to connect different areas of, of town. Uh, many, many uh, cities have, have also implemented this, such as Vancouver and Frankfurt. Um, but here also there's, there's a uh, the really connection here of conservation and biodiversity. So these kind of concepts really emerge. And we also, um, a little bit prior to some of those in America, there was also this, these innovations in, uh, in public health, right? And so we noticed how uh, John Snow in, in London had this breakthrough uh, mapping uh, analysis, really birthing the uh, epidemiology and as a field and the introduction of, of doing more, more uh, technical analysis of public health, they were able to, in this map, what you see is uh, they, they were really concerned about uh, cholera deaths in, in the city and they didn't really know where, uh, what was causing this. And there was a lot of assumptions about people in poverty bringing in disease and immigrants and such. Uh, but Jon Snow, <clears throat> Um, in London really started to isolate the kind of different um, infrastructure pieces and he started to put this together and found in fact that it was tied to the water pumps in the city um, they did they went out and did some field work as well a lot of what we do now today but he went out and did some field work and confirmed some of this through testing of the water pumps and they were able to um, introduce a new method of, of how you resolve some of these endemic public health issues um, Later on, we saw the environmental movement of the 60s and 70s, which a lot of us are familiar with, with uh, uh, really where we saw the cementing of many federal and state policies that regulate our water and air quality um, as well. So we've, we've kind of gone through these eras of greening cities and, and we kind of arrive at this moment of what motivates us today, right? What are we trying to accomplish today? Um, because I think a lot of what we want to do is similar, but it's driven by different reasons and different value systems, right? Where we, we think very differently about uh, economic and racial justice today than we did 100 years ago. Um, we have a way to think about um, these challenges in, in much different capacities than we did before and with much more advanced tools like you saw with uh, Promode's example um, a lot of what, what has been what we've been doing on the technical side is trying to help folks um, access a lot of the data tools so that everyone can be a planner you don't or a, or a civil engineer you don't have to have a fancy degree to do this um, and so a lot of those tools are really helping to democratize um, planning and, and really help bring a lot more of that to bear, right? Uh, but we, you all have are familiar with a lot of the major global issues with climate change. We're seeing in, uh, the frequency and intensity of natural disasters. Um, the, the latest report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was pretty damning, re recently came out. Um, yeah, and has, you know, has, has really um, provided great examples here of what we're seeing. We're seeing faster warming, 
Um, and the one thing is that we're seeing too, and it's really tested now, is that every region is really facing these increasing changes, right? So we're seeing intensifying and uh, the water cycle, we're seeing sea level rise in coastal areas, uh, warming and thawing of our glaciers and ice, uh, ice sheets, uh, changes to the ocean, um, et cetera, marine heat waves. And so a lot of this is, is, is really impactful. Um, but for cities, you know, one thing that really stands out is urban heat and, and flooding and sea level rise. And those things are uh, issues that we're going to be, that we're already confronting and that we have seen um, pretty uh, significantly. Um, and within the resilient Houston strategy, which we were part of, we um, there was some surprise around how little we had been doing around urban heat, given that you know we are we are a hot city, uh, relatively speaking, in the United States. Um, there's been some great work since then, and the city of Houston um, funded a climate impact assessment too, with um, Catherine Hayhoe last year, and there's some fantastic data. <clears throat> that um, was made available through that study. And uh, just a, a small snippet from that is we know that by 2050, summers are, are going to be uh, 40 to 50 day, 40 to 55 days longer in Houston, depending on the, the future tra trajectory of the climate. Um, and how we deal with a lot of this is, is interesting. But thanks to the hard work of, of many local friends, many, probably some of you who are here today who volunteered in the Houston and Harris uh, heat action team, we now have some really great uh, data and one of the more extensive uh, heat mapping data in the country. This is a tool on the right you can see here where we have uh, data for uh, evening, uh, morning and mid-afternoon on urban heat and and there's a lot around this that we can we can grapple with when we know that um, a, a big part of our of our goal here from resilient Houston is we have a, a pretty ambitious goal of planting 4.6 million new trees uh, in the next decade um, here at kinder we've been tracking um, the performance measures of resilient Houston and this is one that we're keeping a close eye on um, but we know that there are several tree plantings also projected in future years, but we are, um, we're seeing uh, a great effort around this. Um, but there are questions too about this. So where is this happening? Um, do we know who it's helping most? Is it, is it able to help those who uh, maybe are in need of, of more um, protection from the elements? Uh, if you're close to, uh, in communities that have, that have higher temperatures and or where you walk and bike more to the transit, et cetera. So those kinds of questions are things we're looking uh, to explore. Many of you know all the numbers around uh, Hurricane Harvey, but we know that over 144,000 homes flooded um, and that 60% six, of them were inside the 500 year floodplain. So a big chunk of these were not in the floodplain. And how do we think about um, you know, how do we grapple with that reality, which is pretty stark too, right? Um, this is a really interesting graphic from Resilient Houston that was also uh, worked on, but you can see the intensity down below of a lot of the, um, a lot of the major sh climate shock events that we've had in the region. Um, and so as you can see, we've, <laughs> these have been growing in, in frequency. It's been actually, it was hard to put them all in this graphic. Um, as by all the combination of what's happened through Ike and the Memorial Day floods and the tax day floods, et cetera. But um, locally, we have kind of seen uh, the face of this. And now we are um, also looking at thinking of what are these economic and social inequities, right? Of especially the compounding effects. And so in a forthcoming report that was commissioned also by Harris County, um, we here at the Kinder Institute looked at where are the compounding damages occurring most. And so what you see on the map on the left is uh, these are zip codes that are in red that have faced the triple onset of uh, impact from Harvey, from Winter Storm Uri and from COVID-19. And some of the, um, just to give a little background on that, we don't have all types of data on this. The data that we did have, we used FEMA individual assistance data. 
uh, for both Harvey and Uri, so areas that had made the most claims to FEMA on, on damages. Uh, and then on COVID, we added in the unemployment, um, it, where the highest area zip codes with unemployment, and we've basically overlaid uh, where those damages occurred the most. So the areas again in red represent um, the triple threat of the zip codes that were the hardest hit or were hit by all three in, in, the, in, in those events. And then the zip codes in blue had, had two of the three major events. The map on the right <clears throat> basically has an outline on all the red zip codes. So all of the compounding zip codes that faced the hardest impact from Harvey, Yuri, and COVID, but overlaid over socio vulnerability index, which is uh, many of you are probably familiar with it, but it includes uh, several 15 indicators, uh, including socioeconomic status and uh, vulnerability, um, et cetera. Sorry, let me. And so I think now what we, one thing that with a lot of these concerns, what I will want to say to this group is we know that three quarters of the infrastructure that will exist in 2050 has yet to be built, right? And so against this incredible and a backdrop of, of, uh, of challenges that we face, <clears throat> there is this incredible opportunity as well. Again, three quarters of the infrastructure that will exist by 2050 in 30 years has yet to be built. And that in the world, not in Houston, but in the world, according to the UN Secretary General. And so I think here, this gives us a lot of hope and it gives us the opportunity to remake our world and to rethink the relationship that we have with um, both gray and green infrastructure. And so a lot of, you know, I think in, in most of these presentations, you all may have questions for the presenter and that may be the case here right now. We'll get into some of that. But I think what, I also have questions for this group and I, you know, I think, how do we, how do we deal with, with some of, with some of these aspects and some of those are, and I'm going to list them one by one, but um, what could we learn from these prior historical advancements in, in city management and engineering for a green infrastructure and how do we better leverage that engineering and design talent that we have here in Houston, I think probably a lot of this is already ongoing efforts and we know a lot of what's going on here. But what else can can we do and innovate in this front? How do we balance um, policy and learn from prior regulations? So here we've, you know, we've, we've done a lot of opt-in regulations, and I can kind of speak to some of those, like what we've done with transit corridor ordinances, or the incentives for green stormwater infrastructure at the city of Houston. Um, so how do we learn from a lot of those experiences that have been opt-in? maybe not as ambitious as they should have been up front. Um, and a lot of them have gone back and been reformed in, in the last few years, but um, how do we kind of do this in a way that also kind of, uh, you know, is ambitious enough and, and, and gets us to where we wanna be? Uh, three, to what extent are we asserting a role for natural boundaries in the policymaking process? So thinking about watershed level planning and. Uh, and not just the political boundaries, right? Are we are we claiming enough uh, here for natural boundaries in this decision-making process? How are we factoring in sustainability and equity up front, and not as an afterthought? And and what I mean by sustainability is is in the infrastructure that we build, how do we ensure that it can have a, a, a long life cycle by protecting it, by making sure that it's fiscally sustainable, um, meaning that we can that it, we can pay for it in the future, not just now, but maintain it. Um, and also that it could create co-benefits for our communities in terms of helping folks have better resilience, better access to parks and green space, um, really thinking about that and then equity up front too. And how do we, how do we put environmental uh, injustices front and center and deal with the, the complicated legacy of racism uh, in our infrastructure, uh, like locally unwanted land uses, where we have cited a lot of a lot of those, uh, and how do we deal with mitigating those effects? Uh, five. How do we get more people involved at the household level and or at the neighborhood level to slow and treat water? So there's a lot of talk around this, but at the at the grand scale. But how do we also activate other networks? We have a lot of special purpose districts in Houston, Harris County, and region a lot of MUDs, a lot of utility districts, 
a lot of people involved in small D, small democracy as we know it. How do we how do we activate those networks in a way that could work in, in our favor for green infrastructure um, as well? And then last, how do we advance this kind of watershed-based uh, development regulations, which has been talked about before too, but uh, and rather than this one size fits all approach and what kind of data or next steps are missing here to support a more nuanced take in this, in this sense. So these are some of the questions I'll leave this group with. I, I hope that um, in many cases that, that these questions can help inspire dialogue and uh, can inspire change. And again, keep an eye out for um, many of the other reports that I mentioned will be out, including the Winterstorm Bury Resilience Assessment for Harris County, the Harris County Housing Study, and it's a 10-year roadmap. Um, and so I think with that, I, I will conclude. I will also just say that we have several interactive tools as well. And if you're interested, I can cover those briefly, but we have, um, the Kinder Institute does have um, several different, and including uh, Data Houston, which is an interactive uh, data component at the neighborhood level where you can really find neighborhood level data. We have the urban data platform, which is more of a data repository. You can download uh, actual data within our system. And, and then the third one here, um, we are developing a resilience and recovery tracker to uh, combine the city of Houston and Harris County's Harvey disaster recovery uh, finances in the, in the one uh, dashboard and then also track performance measures for resilient Houston through some more interactive tools and you can see how a lot of that tree planting is occurring, et cetera. So, um, so I know there's a lot to, to carry in within 20 minutes, but um, yeah, I'm here for any questions. Oh, Louise, thank you so much. Uh, I, I would say you followed in the uh, previous Kinder Institute speakers very well. Thank you very, very much for your, uh, for your slides and your, and your talk today. Uh, real quick, so we can get uh, uh, keeping on schedule. Um, there was a question about the uh, the flood insurance four to one ratio. There was that based on a five hundred year floodplain. Yeah, it's five hundred year, one hundred year, and then the flood wave. So it included everything that was in a defined everything, everything. floodplain. That was the four to one ratio of, yeah, of insured versus not insured. Okay, yeah, that's right. Um, so and and. I, I know the answer to this question. Perhaps you, you'll elaborate uh, as, as our guest. Um, there was a question about why uh, lower income housing is not a component of some new projects. Uh, and there was a specific location mentioned, but I think this is more global than that. You know, where does the burden lie in making sure that LMIs are included in, in areas as we grow so that that portion of our housing is, is not underserved as clearly your, clearly your data is showing it is. Um, where does that burden lie and what do we need to do to, uh, to get more of that level? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's a phenomenon that is affecting every city in America. This isn't, we're not, you know, this, we're not special in this regard. Uh, it is, it is a problem everywhere. Um, and looking at the cost of that kind of housing is also incredibly expensive, um, just because of the income of the respective tenants, right? And so I think uh, as opposed to if you're doing something more in the middle income range, the housing and maintenance costs, you, you, you might be able to substantiate that more often. So it, this is really a shared responsibility across the board for from everyone. A government cannot do it alone. Philanthropy cannot cover the gap. And even if we all come together in a best case scenario, and I think you're gonna see some of that in the Harris County Housing Report, You'll see a little bit of snippets about this, but even if we put all of our resources together, uh, including more private capital, it's going to be incredibly, we're going to be incredibly short from our from the need. Mm -hmm. There needs to be more federal assistance in this regard. There needs to be potentially state assistance also in this regard. Um, and we need to have the ability to, one thing that we don't address directly in the in the housing study is also just better wages at the very bottom end of the spectrum that right. would really help and i'm not saying we need to increase the minimum wage i mean i potentially my personal opinion is yes but um i'm saying we just need better livable wages in general so that people can afford the housing that exists on the market that's already there uh, i think a combination of those kinds of efforts um can make a big dent but it is a, an, it's an it's a massive challenge um 
all throughout America. Yeah. Yeah, we're really illustrating the difference between what it costs to build a residence versus what the inhabitants of those residents make uh, for a living. And we're at a point now where it is it is uh, becoming, frankly, almost unsustainable. Right. Exactly. That that is that is what we're seeing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Luis, I want to thank you again on behalf of all of our attendees for coming today and, and, and presenting. Uh, this was very informational, very useful. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity and um, I'm excited about the rest of the program and um, we'll be we'll be listening in. All right, as are we excited, but uh, we're going to take a really short break. Uh, we call these a little bio break. We know you've been sitting at your computer for the last couple hours, so um, give you a short bio break. During the break, I want to just mention that uh, in the chat, uh, we make uh, available to you uh, the uh, uh, speaker uh, bios. I don't read those uh, during these events. Y'all can read those yourselves and, and see all the credentials of, of all of our speakers. Um, we'll be showing some slides of our sponsors. Uh, but also a couple of short videos. Uh, but we'll be back here and uh, with our next presenter in just a few minutes. So uh, let's make this uh, as short as we can. We've got a program for five. Uh, let's see if we can do it in three. We'll be back with you in about three minutes. Thank you so much.
All right. Well, welcome back, everybody. Uh, I appreciate uh, you coming back on uh, a little bit of a short notice. We just want to stay on schedule today. I do want to mention real quick our, uh, our break sponsors there uh, and for the rest of the day, uh, BGE, uh, Harris County Engineering, Harris County Flood Control District, uh, Beacon Offshore Energy, and also Walter P. Moore. We want to thank them very much for their sponsorship of today's event, as with our other sponsors as well. Uh, and I do uh, want to say uh, in, in the chat, there's also a vir what we call a virtual swag bag, uh, some information about some of our sponsors. But uh, let's get right back into things. Uh, I see our next presenters are, are teed up on my screen there. I'd like to introduce Augie Campbell, who is Executive Director of the Association of Water Board Directors, and also Chris Dougherty, Senior Project Manager and an Associate at BGE Inc. Uh, welcome, gentlemen. Uh, glad to have you here today. Um, we've got you uh, talking about what we call the uh, Houston Community Plan, and I know that each of you have been um, involved in a lot of the, the future planning, uh, and specifically some, uh, you know, a great number of, of that effort or, or has come out of the results of, of these recent storm events and how we can make our community more resilient and uh, uh, really appreciate you guys coming and, and talking to us today. So uh, off and running, you guys take it away. It's a pleasure to be here, Chris. Thanks so much for having us. And um, I, I just, we have an abundance of Chris's that I get to work with and very happy to, to be presenting with Chris Doherty and just looking through the audience. There are so many people that um, I'm really happy to um, get to present to you. Um, love to hear what you have to say. I thought Luis's presentation really did ask a lot of the questions and we, we attempt to provide some answers. We certainly don't have all the answers. And I do think that the audience we have here, so many of you have worked hard on the answers for our community and we welcome your input on our plan. And that's one thing we, I, I like to say at the beginning of these presentations, is that our program, our, our plan is always in beta. And many of you have worked with us on this plan like Mary Ann Pincentini, um, you, you Chris Brown, uh, we got Andy Palermo on the call, Alan Black. We've, been, we've really benefited a lot from the, the input of others and we, we wanna to continue to do that because this is really a, um, something we all do together. Um, and we've been doing this for a long time, not you know, just me, but Houston. Houston was founded on Buffalo Bayou. We have known that we have flooded since we were founded. That was a given. Uh, we've, we've worked on plans. Uh, I didn't see the Comey plan yet, but that's one of my favorites. I know for those of you who've attended uh, BPA conferences, it, at least once a conference, we see the Comey plan. We're not going to show you that today, but we are, that's in our minds as we work on these issues and the need to blend gray and green infrastructure is, is at the top of the list. And really, the more we can make any gray infrastructure look like green infrastructure, that's been something that Chris Doherty and the BGE folks that we've worked with have really tried to do. Um, but before we go into that, I, I wanna turn it over to Chris to talk about what Houston has done historically, really starting with the 1940 plan. Great, thanks, Augie. Um, I will get good use of my cursor or maybe not. There we go. Oh, I did it backwards. Augie, can you back up? I'm sorry. So what we're looking at here is an overview of the 1940s plan that was developed by the Corps of Engineers really as a response to the 1929 and 1935 flooding that you saw a picture of just a moment ago. You can see in the middle of the image, a much smaller Houston. You can see on the West, the attics and Barker reservoirs, which did get constructed in the 1940s. But then you can see a bunch of other elements in this plan that never got constructed. So on the south side, there was a south canal. And that was a canal that was intended to uh, collect the water that was released from attics and Barker reservoirs, uh, conveyed a short distance down Buffalo Bayou to near Beltway 8, current location, and bring it to Galveston Bay. On the way, it would have intercepted upper runoff from Bray's Bayou and Sims Bayou. Um, it never got built. Um, new projects got added and constructed for Bray's and Sims. But again, South Canal is, uh, is never happened and will not happen. On the upper left, you see a, a levee that would have kept natural overflows from Cypress Creek 
uh, to be contained inside of Cypress Creek to continue having them flow east, um, eventually towards the San Jacinto River. And then also nearer to the city of Houston, uh, there was intended to be a white oak reservoir and a, and a discharge canal that would have got water out of that reservoir to the San Jacinto River. So two things happened, the reservoirs. What didn't happen was uh, you know, a bunch of other things and, and those other things would have um, made a significant help. Um, but all that said, we thought for a very long time that we were relatively well protected because of those reservoirs. Uh, that dynamic changed drastically in the last decade. Uh, we had three significant rainstorms in a row, flood, the 2016 tax day flood. It had a rainfall of about 16 inches in the Attic's reservoir watershed and Hurricane Harvey that had about 31 inches of rainfall in the Attic's reservoir watershed and up to 47 inches elsewhere in the region. <coughs> and so what we saw in those storms is that the tax day flood just about filled Attic's reservoir and Barker Reservoir to the extents of their government owned land, but it was considered a success. Harvey was not considered a success. They had significant flooding outside of government owned land. And then the operation of those reservoirs in the 2015 and 2016 storms, the gates on those reservoirs were only opened after downstream flooding had subsided. And so they discharged at three or 4,000 CFS within the capacity of those channels for a few weeks. Harvey, it was opened in the middle of the flooding event really because the Corps of Engineers was really concerned about the viability of the reservoirs. They saw that property upstream was already flooding they thought that it was a great potential for significant additional rainfall. They opened the gates in the middle of the storm and discharged at 15,000 CFS for several days and had a slow taper to 3,000 CFS. Um, so not only were homes flooded on the upstream side of the government owned land, but also significant flooding in the, in the corridor, in Buffalo Bayou corridor downstream as well. So as you can see, you know, the unfinished projects that the Corps of Engineers would have intended in the 1940s, they most likely would have had significant uh, reduction on our flooding issues, but nevertheless, we still are prone to flooding on Buffalo Bayou. Augie. So what we like to say is that Houston does not lack planning. Um, we lack resolve. And so after Hurricane Harvey, a lot of the organizations who had been, you know, and we had membership that was affected and really we brought together a, a, um, the idea that we should not be short of resolve and we should have a goal. Um, and so Houston Stronger supports the goal of trying to make sure that every community in our region can withstand 12 inches of water in 24 hours. And so between our respective organizations and our volunteers like BGE, um, we and I, I give Chris and his team a lot of credit for, for helping us develop this plan, but they certainly weren't the only engineers involved or the only people involved. We, we had truly a group effort in developing um, essentially a, a $68 billion plan for our region um, and that number keeps going up. The first time we released this plan, it was 58 billion. Um, so costs continue to go up and, and every day we don't get that infrastructure in the ground, that number is gonna rise. Uh, and so, so do the odds of, of risk um, for people. But we wanna make sure that um, we really do work across our region. Uh, and, and really our plan is gonna concentrate on a very specific set of projects within this broader plan. And really that's because of the Corps' response. Um, there, there's a unique opportunity when it comes to Buffalo Bayou um, to, to do work. But I wanna, before we get to that specific plan, Houston Stronger really is focused on the region. And we are really trying to make sure that there is um, more of a 
concept and a goal than to, to dictate particular projects that we have to do. Um, so one of the, we, we also want to go, I'm going to brag on, on our organization for a little bit. After Hurricane Harvey, when we came together, the first thing we wanted to make sure that we did was get a federal response that was somewhat in line with responses we saw after uh, Tropical Storm Sandy um, and other major hurricane events. Um, and I will say that we didn't get everything we asked for, but um, basically, Congress passed the Bipartisan Budget Act, which included $89.4 billion for resiliency. Uh, the Corps received over $17 billion. Uh, HUD also received um, several billion dollars. And we saw that many of those HUD funds are, are trickling into our region to, uh, but not exactly where we would like, I'll admit. Um, we, we still have a lot of work to do. Um, Harris County passed a, a $2.5 billion flood bond that is making a significant difference. And I know Alan's going to address that. Um, we also um, were very appreciative of uh, Senate Bills 7 and 8. Um, Dade Phelan and Brandon Creighton were critical in getting those two pieces of legislation passed along with um, many other state legislators. And it took us from being in a position where, you know, we, we didn't really plan for flooding at the state level um, and we didn't have any funding to having almost $2 billion um, to, to address immediate flood concerns, as well as a long range planning effort to provide a state plan. Um, and so we'll have a state plan in place by 2024. Um, and we also have an opportunity right now potentially to get $500 million in the flood infrastructure fund, which would actually take care of the funding gap that we see as occurring between the end of 2022 and 2024. So, um, and that those hearings are going on right now at the state capitol in the special session. So we're, we're hoping that um, some of the ARPA, the $16 billion in ARPA funding will go to flood infrastructure. And so, um, if, if any of you um, are interested in details, you know, please, uh, we, we have a email address at the end of this and hope you'll, you'll get in touch because there are things you can do right now. But this is not a program to focus on that. It's really a, a program to focus on what our organization did collectively in response to uh, the core. Um, we really felt like, you know, the core's interim report that they issued um, last year really did um, unite the community, um, but maybe not quite the way the community intended. And so that's where I'm gonna turn it back over to Chris to explain the CORE's report. Okay, well, um, so what we saw um, is that the CORE's report focused on really three watersheds, a, a little bit ancillary on the two parallel ones, White Oak Bayou and Bray's Bayou, but mostly on Attics and Barker. Um, the plan was looking at, um, first of all, how to optimize uh, the operation of Attics Reservoir, Barker Reservoir. You know, they have significant um, issues um, looking at potential flooding in their flood pool upstream of both reservoirs, and as well as, you know, a significant deficit in conveyance of you know, the ability for Buffalo Bayou to convey flows downstream. And so really what they put together was a study that, that had several different individual piece alternatives, um, but they came up with um, a plan that was focused on just two. Um, the, the first of those was um, alternative two, which was channelizing Buffalo Bayou. In other words, increasing its conveyance capacity. Uh, also constructing a new reservoir on the Katy Prairie along Cypress Creek. In essence, probably replicating the function of, of that prior levee that was never built. <clears throat> so um, to perhaps steal a phrase from Alan Black, um, we recognized that this was not a plan that fit within the community's uh, values within the community's natural values. And, you know, there was a significant um, opposition to channelization of Buffalo Bayou 
that frankly started this organization, BPA, uh, with Terry Hershey and former President Bush that opposed it more than 60 years ago. Um, a massive reservoir on Katy Prairie would destroy critical ecosystems and faces fierce community opposition and it doesn't solve the problem. So let's see, there we go. So the, the Buffalo Bayou community plan goals, you know, really we want to, wanted to give a, a framework a concept framework to the Corps of Engineers to prove that there was a different plan that was possible. And so their goal is, is probably to um, develop a plan that focuses on their standard project flood, but also addresses the probable maximum flood. Our plan was looking at a Harvey type event, uh, you know, a replication of a Harvey type event. And the goal for that was to convey floodwaters within the boundaries of the federal lands, federal owned lands for both Attucks and Barker reservoirs, uh, to add conveyance downstream of Attucks and Barker reservoirs to handle floodwater releases, but without doing channelization. Uh, we want to look at reducing flood conditions resulting from local rainfall in the Buffalo Bayou watershed uh, and, and avoid the negative impacts and en enhance long-term environmental impacts in the Katy Prairie along the Bayou Channel. Um, we even have some considerations for the Houston Ship Channel. And more than anything, we wanna have a broad and prolonged community support from a diverse group of stakeholders. And you saw Augie's list. It's a very diverse group of stakeholders um, to take advantage of, of various funding op opportunities, but also without public support, this project never gets built. So this is a, a snapshot of the plan. There's really four big elements. Uh, the first of those elements is a flood tunnel. And number one is a flood tunnel that would provide relief for the reservoirs as well as the downstream bayou and its tributaries. We'll dive into all of these in much more detail. The second uh, component is looking at excavation within the reservoirs that would allow a Harvey type storm to remain within the boundaries of the government owned land. In essence, to replace the storage that currently exists on private property in the flood pool. Uh, the third um, component is adding upstream retention and storage, but not with a big reservoir. Uh, upstream in Upper Cypress watershed and Upper Attics watershed and then Component four works with that, the protection and restoration of the upper Cypress Creek watershed. So let's dive into each of those. First is looking at the tunnel aspect. Uh, our plan is looking at constructing, give or take a 40 foot diameter tunnel that's capable of conveying 10 to 15,000 CFS of flood water from Attucks and Barker reservoirs to Galveston Bay. It would have interceptors along the route of the tunnel that would significantly increase flood protection from the local watershed events. And so it would have uh, interceptors in several different places. And also it has the possibility of augmenting water supply. We're looking at running this tunnel past the city of Houston's East Water Purification Plant, uh, perhaps as a, as, a, as a source of additional water for the city. So I mentioned the size of the tunnel uh, and one of the key considerations that I, I assume the Corps is gonna be looking at is optimizing the size of that tunnel. You know, our plan is nominally looking at a 40 foot diameter tunnel, but really the biggest cost, um, forgive me for simplifying this, but the biggest cost of building a tunnel is building a tunnel. So for a little bit more money, we could have a bigger tunnel and have a significantly larger impact. In the range of 30, 40, or 50 foot diameter tunnels, every 10 feet of additional diameter essentially doubles the capacity of that tunnel. So this is on the top, uh, a, a schematic profile of that tunnel. And on the bottom is a schematic map of that tunnel system. And you'll notice that it follows the right of way of the I-10 corridor. And again, this is a concept plan. It's by no means set in stone, it, but it is a publicly available right of way that 
you know, would have to have significant coordination with TxDOT, as would any route to get to the ship channel or to San Jacinto River. Uh, you can see different, um, first of all, the primary openings would be in Attics and Barker Reservoir, but, but you also see several other different openings um, that would be on major tributaries, some of which have major flood problems. Rummel Creek is one, uh, Briar Branch is one, Spring Branch is another, and White Oak Bayou, where it crosses each of them. They each have significant problems, and it could give early relief for, for those systems in a storm. And you could certainly see other interceptors downstream. And that's one thing I wanted to just kind of talk about, Chris, is that, you know, Marianne Piancentini um, and others have been working with us to kind of have those conversations and figure out where opportunities are, especially um, east of the Beltway are. And so we don't necessarily illustrate all of those opportunities. Um, and, you know, where, but where these inlets are and very importantly, where the outlet is, will be something that we want to work with stakeholders a lot to discuss. We've talked to the port, um, we've talked to other stakeholders on, on the east side of town um, and want to make sure that we have really good input and ideas uh, that we can provide to the core. Because ultimately, these are our ideas. The core gets to build this project. Um, we just get to, you know, kind of hopefully work to bring the community together so this project is easier to build. And one of the reasons it should be so easy is because we are the only, and I'm going to steal Chris's thunder here, we're the only city, major city in Texas that doesn't have a flood tunnel. Right. So it, it's not stealing thunder. It's all good. It's true. San Antonio has two storm tunnels that prevent flooding in downtown and the Riverwalk. They've been in place for over 20 years. The river tunnel's 24 feet in diameter. It's about three miles long. Uh, the water in the tunnel after rain events are used for the Riverwalk Canal. City of Austin and City of Dallas have more recent tunnels. The Waller Creek Tunnel in Austin was completed its construction about nine years ago. Uh, the Mill Creek Drainage Relief Tunnel in Dallas is currently under construction. Those are 24 and 38 foot diameter tunnels respectively. Okay, so component two. <clears throat> this is looking at adding com compensating storage volume in each of the reservoirs. And again, this offsets the loss of volume that is in the flood pool upstream of the, the current government owned land. And so uh, by a pure coincidence, we identified a need for about 76,000 acre feet for each of those reservoirs. And we'd use dredge material to create topography and add ecological, um, um, uh, I guess, diversity within these reservoir areas. Um, these are a pair of, of schematic ideas that were prepared by, uh, by our uh, BPA's former chairman, Kevin Shanley. Uh, for Houston Stronger. And, and the idea is to create um, excavation to lower the elevation to create more storage. There could be the addition of several lakes. And again, there could be the addition of, of high topography areas so that, so that this spoil volume doesn't have to go out. Uh, transporting dirt is very expensive. Moving at a short distance is significantly less expensive. So this is a possibility for Attics Reservoir. This is a possibility for Barker Reservoir. Augie, did and you I want to make say, mention of something that's current? Yeah, um, we already have, uh, well, I won't say we, there's, there's a project with the Willowport Drainage District where they've already approached the core and received some preliminary um, Kind of exploratory approval, so Willowfort can can start working on that project. And I think there is a real opportunity to move some projects forward while we develop a larger master plan. And it's important for you know different stakeholders to really work together to make sure that we have a consistent vision while we're really making headway and providing immediate flood benefits. Um, and the, the one thing I like about the Willowfort Drainage District Plan is it really does incorporate green infrastructure concepts and recreation. So it really does try to layer in a lot of those things. So it's consistent with, you know, the design by Kevin Shanley, but there's a, there is a real need to sort of coordinate. There are also a whole bunch of projects that the flood control district is starting to 
to get gain core approval on to move forward in, especially in addicts. And so again, you know, I'm, I don't, I, I always say that my intent is never to make the flood control district's job harder, but I feel like that's just a natural outgrowth of some of the work that we do. Um, so Alan, I hope I'm not making your job harder, but I do think there is a real opportunity to really kind of work, and you all have done a great job. The flood control district has really worked with the community to make sure that there is a reflection of community voices and values in the projects that they do. And here is an opportunity to really do that. And I think Kevin and the way he's illustrated this has really given us a great vision for what can be done. Okay, so the third and fourth components really go lockstep together. The, the third would be to acquire land to construct more uh, shallower storage in Upper Cypress Creek watershed, Upper Attics uh, watershed. You know, some of that would be expanding the prairie, creating shallow retention, uh, in a sense, replicating old rice farming techniques, perhaps. Um, and then having shallow detention in, in both Upper Cypress and retention storage in Upper Attics Reservoir. And this is another place, if you'll go back to that slide, where we've yeah, I'll stolen. I'll let you go back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, where we, we have, again, or incorporated someone else's vision, uh, mainly Katy Prairie Conservancy, Miriam Piancentini and Larry Dunbar and their team did a fantastic job of, of really putting these concepts together. And they, you know, they were so consistent with a lot of what Houston Stronger was talking about. Um, and, and Marianne was gracious enough to let us kind of incorporate those into this presentation. So thanks. Right. And so uh, the fourth component is really the extension of that. And that is expanding the prairie's natural ability to absorb, slow down, and store floodwaters in the upper Cypress Creek watershed. So expanding protected lands, um, getting landowner agreements to provide shallow depressional wetlands to permanently reduce runoff, um, create detention elements along Upper Cypress Creek, creating about 33,000 acre feet of storage in the Upper Cypress Creek watershed. And the benefit is reducing that overflow. The, it's a natural overflow, but reducing that by about 40% in volume of, of water that would come to Attic's Reservoir. That's a huge thing. Okay, I think I'm trying to click. Okay, good. So I'm going to go back a little bit to to what all of this would help. And it feels a little like I might be going back to tunnels, but I'm going back to holistic watershed. You know, just recognize that Buffalo Bayou downstream of reservoirs, it's about 32 miles of stream. And except for the portion that's upstream of Beltway 8, and downstream of Shepherd, the, the public has almost no easements or right-of-way. Adjoining lander, landowners own to the middle of Buffalo Bayou. Uh, it's a naturalized stream. It's not been channelized or improved between Beltway 8 and Shepherd Drive. The banks are steep, they're irregular, and some landowners have installed uh, projects to, uh, to control erosion. But very little vegetation grows on the banks um, due to a lot of factors. The, the first you know, it is a natural channel, but our urbanization has still stressed the channel. You know, either releases from our um, our sewage treatment plant releases, uh, flashier urban flooding, more frequent uh, urban flooding. All of those things have stressed the bayou, which makes it a lot harder for vegetation to grow. The channel itself is trying to adapt while we keep changing the rules. And so you can see that you know, the other channels that are nearby, Sims and Brays, well, they have significant structural um, solutions, if you will, that probably have fewer um, community and natural values, fewer ecological values for sure. Um, but Buffalo Bayou, because it has not been improved, has only about a 4,000 CFS capacity before uh, structural flooding starts to occur. So this Buffalo Bayou community plan would divert approximately 72% of the water that would currently flow down Buffalo Bayou, and that will help reduce erosion. Um, and then uh, flood control district manages and maintains area bayous that are draining to the ship channel. Um, again, some of the others have, you know, much uh, already have uh, structural improvements put in. Um, 
but also thinking about erosion that happens upstream of the reservoirs. Uh, there's a lot of uh, erosion that's happening in upper Buffalo Bayou, in upper Bear Creek, South Mady Creek, uh, that it also goes through the reservoirs and, and into Buffalo Bayou. And so we would develop a plan so that the tunnel openings would be a little bit above the, the elevation of, of the reservoirs so that the silt could be settled, captured, and, and removed as appropriate in time and, and keep that out of Buffalo Bayou, keep it out of the ship channel. Um, so the tunnel outlet, one of the things that we definitely wanna consider is what is the condition in the tunnel outlet? And you know, we would most certainly know that that has to be a significant design feature. What you're seeing on the right is the outlet facility for Waller Creek Tunnel that's in Austin, and it's really a stilling basin. In other words, it releases the water into a flat body of water that can reduce its velocity to enough that, that the receiving channel can handle its discharge. Augie, you're back. Right, and we just want to say that this is just part of a much bigger plan and a much bigger effort. There is a real opportunity when it comes to Buffalo Bayou and you know Attics and Barker because of the core. Um, there's litigation that could provide a funding solution. There's congressional action that could provide a funding solution. There are a lot of ways to get to a solution, but it, it requires community support. And so that's why it's important for not just us to work on this, but for everybody who really is impacted. And so we'd like to encourage all stakeholders, the more we can work together on a common vision, the more likely it is that that vision happens. And if there are other things that are outside of Buffalo Bayou, again, you know, we want to work with um, those individuals and uh, groups that are really trying to advance a plan, you know, a, a, an area where we, uh, and I, we didn't cover it here, but, you know, the coastal spine, E, you know, in mid-bay solution, those are things that we, we, we support, we've looked into, and we really do want to encourage better dialogue and better solutions. And, and we think that the community's made a lot of progress because of the collaboration that we've seen. So if we can help in any way, please reach out. Um, we'd like to, to work with more groups uh, than we have right now. So thank you all for letting us speak. Uh, you know, and, and I will say that Buffalo, or sorry, Bayou Preservation Association has really, you know, y'all started on Buffalo Bayou, but y'all really expanded and y'all's mission is, is something that Houston Stronger really appreciates and feels like there's a lot of alignment. So thank y'all for having us. Well, thank you, Augie and Chris. We appreciate that and, and, and the shout out as well. We, we uh, acknowledge our participation. We really thank you for allowing us to do so uh, and contributing the, the messages of our, of our members, um, which, which range from, you know, water quality concerns to, uh, to native plantings, to, to the, as, as, uh, as we've heard from our original founder, the critters on the bayou, uh, you know, the, 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 the wildlife is also a concern and, and uh, y'all are tasked with a very broad, uh, you know, trying to solve a, a problem that is, is area wide and with so many different components. Uh, it, I've got a lot of questions and we're gonna try and run through these as quickly as we can so we can get on to the next presentation. But um, I think one of the things that, that uh, is, is of uh, primary concern to us is, is how, what would be the effect of the bios? And there's a couple of things that I think go into that. One is uh, in, in the design solutions, has there been any consideration about riparian uh, efforts along those side slopes rather than just engineered solutions? Uh, and then the other thing is, what about the, the ability of the ship channel itself to take that much water at that location? I think you just went into that at the very end. Um, you're talking about a pretty massive amount of water on a 40 foot diameter. Um, any idea of what kind of area would be needed to uh, make sure that, that we're not overloading the, the, uh, the ship channel in that location? Uh, those, those two questions. So I, I think I'll field them perhaps in reverse order. Uh, regarding the ship channel and its ability to accept this kind of runoff, um, I, I can tell you that, that the ship channel, because of its dredging and improvement for ship traffic, has a considerable amount of capacity to, to convey flows. Um, I, I can also tell you that the floodplains that are defined in it are at least downstream of Turning Basin 
entirely attributable, primarily attributable to um, to hurricane storm surge as opposed mm -hmm. to inland flooding. And so, so you know, clearly it would be an analytical uh, question, but I think that the ship channel and especially the river downstream of it have significant capacity to take these flows. And and then as far as um, solutions to um, to avoid erosion. I think the entire purpose of this is to avoid um, a Sims Braze White Oak type of a solution and find mm -hmm. something where Buffalo Bayou could heal itself through riparian uh, ways and, and give it the framework so that we can, you know, stop changing the rules on it as it tries to stabilize. Right. Well, well, how far under the surface would a tunnel be located? That's a good question. I, I was, uh, I'm going to say a sidekick to a presentation that was primarily to um, to structural engineers last week, including the TxDOT bridge engineers. And you know, this graphic says they're 100 feet below ground, but but they said the the foundations under Beltway Eight are at least 170 feet deep. So it would be deep, at least 100 <laughs> feet, and and perhaps deeper to avoid vertical conflicts or shifting it outside of those vertical conflicts to avoid them. And I will say another thing about the some of the constraints on this plan is it is really trying to reduce the amount of land that has to be purchased or and, and especially the number of homes that would need to be condemned. Um, a lot of this is about preserving communities. And so, you know, I think Kevin's depiction really shows that, you know, the tunnel really does shrink the floodplain. So again, you can keep people in their homes. Yeah, I, so you just kind of alluded to one of the other questions and it'll be our last one in that uh, many people may not know that uh, beyond the actual, what you see on your map there, the green areas of the Attics and Barker Reservoirs, the reservoirs extend past that to the west even further and homes were allowed to be built there. And we saw on one of your other maps where you look at existing uh, floodplain conditions farther and farther west uh, that may not be, you know, those are, considered, if you will, green fields right now, not a lot of development, but probably some development. What do we need to do in order to remove more homes from that potential, you know, next disaster, right? It, are buyouts a, con a, a component of uh, this plan? And yeah, originally, and especially in the broader plan, the Buffalo Bayou Community Plan really focuses on what the core in particular, uh, as well as flood control district can do to, to use, you know, kind of uh, green space, uh, whether they own it or can acquire it to, to minimize the need for buyouts of homes, but contained in the larger um, Houston Stronger plan, you know, this, this plan here, there is the need to acquire repar reparting corridors. Uh, wrapped up in that plan. So yes, buyouts are a big component of this broader plan. I see. But, but on this Buffalo Bayou community plan, it, it really is in, a, in essence the opposite. You know, the, mm -hmm. the people who are, you know, at risk upstream in the flood pools, you know, they're outside of the, uh, at least the current 100-year floodplain. And, and so um, the intention is to um, increase the discharge out of the reservoirs and increase the storage within them so that they are removed from at least a Harvey type storm and, and hopefully a standard project flood storm, uh, which is, that's about 25 inches in a day. Um, so something, and so so that's really the, the hope for this plan is to avoid having to do massive buyouts upstream of the reservoirs. And I will say every part of this plan, you know, if there is a way to avoid taking people out of their homes and preserve mm -hmm. communities. That is the preference right. of this plan. Yep. Understandable, yes. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for this presentation and update on uh, resilient uh, efforts by you. Uh, yeoman's work, I know. <laughs> so thanks so much thank for presenting you. today. Thank you all. We'll move straight on to our next presentation. Uh, we've got uh, Nick Russo with us today, uh, Director of Environmental and Sustainability Services at Harris County Engineering Department. 
And, uh, you know, the county has had uh, some uh, low impact and green stormwater, uh, green infrastructure um, initiatives and uh, procedures and, and uh, agreed upon uh, criteria for, for a little while. And we've got a lot of examples that have used these uh, already. And so Nick is going to do some presentation on, on what those are and some of the effects and, and benefits. Uh, appreciate you being here, Nick. Good to see you. Take you it away. Too. You too. Well, thanks everybody. I'm glad to be here. Glad to be here with you all virtually. Um, heard a lot of good talks today, so I'm going to jump right in. Uh, this presentation is really about uh, following the theme on green infrastructure, and I'm going to talk about uh, the county's role in green stormwater infrastructure. Uh, primarily, what I what I hope you all walk away with from this conversation is really just seeing how uh, green stormwater infrastructure or low impact development can sort of cross uh, multiple sustainability programs, if you will. Um, and I hope you hope you find that uh, entertaining, educational, and, uh, and something you can walk away with and implement in, in your own practices. Uh, the first thing I wanna start with really is uh, sustainability. And sustainability is important, I know, to all of you. Uh, it's important to Harris County, and it's, and it's very important to the department that I work with. Um, and as Chris mentioned, we've been <clears throat> engaged heavily in green infrastructure uh, 10 or 11 years now um, and, and really have learned a lot. So uh, green infrastructure is, is, is an important part of the work that we're doing. Um, we do see uh, green infrastructure playing a role in, in other programs that we'll talk about. Um, and really, we just continue to work uh, and refine our overall programs with uh, countywide goals and initiatives, working with various stakeholders throughout the county, um, reporting metrics, uh, plans, and that sort of thing. So green, green infrastructure that I would like to focus on today, um, there are various definitions. Uh, some people would collectively refer to, you know, various the creeks and, and natural habitat as, as natural green infrastructure in the county, which I do agree with. The, the, the point uh, of this conversation really is about green stormwater infrastructure that we can implement into site developments, uh, both uh, projects the county has done, maybe the city has done, maybe that you have done as well. So we're focusing on those techniques that are at the site um, and the types of practices that, that you would see doing that are obviously bioretention systems, swales, uh, permeable paving, um, rainwater harvesting, that sort of thing. So one thing to mention is uh, going back 10 years now, more than 10 years, uh, we went through a process, had the low impact development competition in Houston, if any of y'all remember that, uh, went forward with a process to develop a, uh, some standards and criteria for the use of low impact development and green infrastructure. Uh, and, and over time, we've seen a lot, of, a lot of these techniques being implemented in the region. Um, there's a, a number of projects out there uh, that you can you know, go look at. Some of them use uh, different types of, of techniques. Uh, but over time, my point is we, we've gotten more accustomed to what those are, uh, how to design them, how to build them, that sort of thing. Um, and, and, as we planned all along, we knew that you know we would go through processes to to potentially review or update and and just continue to learn in that regard. So we do have uh, some discussions ongoing about you know just small updates to this type of criteria. Uh, and one of the things that I that I want to mention is the county is involved in in developing uh, imagination zones, and we have teams of people that are working on this and. Um, this really applies to, you know, building new housing uh, from Hurricane Harvey recovery uh, CDBG type funding dollars. So the in in imagination zones are, are here to really um, do different types of development that uh, maybe we haven't seen in Houston before. A um, lot, lot more connectivity, different types of, of homes. Um, and, and a major component of that is that we want to encourage green infrastructure in those co communities. So one of the standard type uh, documents that, that is being developed is, is really some design standards to do that. 
and and that will once that's finalized it'll kind of tie directly back into our overall uh county criteria for low impact development and even for folks who are not you know necessarily uh uh designing that type of project our intent has been that whatever you know standards and things like that that are in here could be used for others uh, you know to to use uh, on your own types of projects so educational in that regard um, and within those standards so one major component of that uh, is really sort of showing people more what what types of examples you could have uh, using green infrastructure so this is just one rendering here uh, that's included in those types of standards again just to provide that that visual element because if you're not if you're not working on those types of projects and you're looking to to uh, do that or incorporate designs into different um, developments then being able to see it or explain it to people visually is, is helpful and then beyond <clears throat> just the uh, the visual aspects um, the standard document does include kind of typical uh, drawings, if you will, for, for engineers um, to use. This is one example that shows a bioretention basin uh, that can be used in those projects. And so let's talk about some of the programs that, that we do that, that can use green infrastructure. So I know most of y'all are familiar with LEED. Uh, we use LEED standards in all of our county um, building since 2009. Uh, we currently own and operate uh, nine LEED certified buildings. We have a, a, a LEED Platinum facility, which is uh, the first um, government facility in the Gulf Coast region, which is the Burnett Balin Gym in Precinct 3, and four other facilities are, are LEED Gold. Um, so LEED is a big part of what we do in, in building facility design um, and green infrastructure obviously uh, ha has a place in that site development and the LEED, uh, LEED system offers you know, points for incorporating those types of things into the design. And something new, uh, new to infrastructure sustainability is the Envision program. And if you're not familiar with it, I kind of describe it as you know, LEED is a sustainability program for buildings. Envision is a sustainability program for infrastructure type projects. Uh, and over the last two years, we've been really uh, kind of diving more deeply into Envision. We've been collaborating with uh, ACEC on training and, and getting people certified or credentialed in, in Envision. We now have more than 50 staff uh, who are trained in the program. And, and Obviously, we're not going to go through all of the Envision uh, program aspects and, and points here, but green infrastructure, again, similar to LEED, uh, can, can provide benefits and, and points uh, in working with the program. And we do have one, one project on the county side that's uh, currently going through the process. It's a Precinct 2 uh, project that's on Coa Street. Um, we're really excited about that. The precinct started out the project and wanted to achieve a, a platinum level of, of designation on the project. And as, as part of that implementation of Envision, we've, in going through the process, we've made sustainable commitments for projects that will follow the Envision program. And, and that's one of the things that, you know, will help us with other projects that might use Envision uh, as well as, you know, going through the process to satisfy different program elements within Envision. And this particular project is, um, is currently out for uh, bids or actually pro proposals uh, to, to, um, to eventually go construct the project. So it's moving along now pretty good. Some of the project elements in this, in this project are uh, improved pedestrian safety within trails and sidewalks, uh, connected connectivity to Halls Bayou, which is on one end of the project, and James Driver Park, which is a, a really good park and community uh, center that's out in this area, um, and a lot of resiliency, uh, sustainability elements that are included in, in the program here. And one of, the, one of the other things I'll mention about Envision is through this process, to, to satisfy um, 
some points here, we've, we've begun to look at how to address sustainable products. Um, and, and, I, and the types of products that I'm talking about here are products that you would use in an infrastructure project. So think of, you know, your paving might be one major element, right? Uh, storm sewer pipe, that sort of thing. Things that you're going to use a lot of in a in this type of project, which is which is a roadway project. Um, so we've had conversations with different uh, different product manufacturers to try to identify these things. My my summary of of those conversations is that there are definitely some different programs out here. Um, what I'm finding is that it's it's kind of new to to this this industry, um, but I expect over time that we'll probably see more. Um, products that are used in infrastructure projects that that can meet a sustainable uh, certification program. The next the next program that I'll talk about is our countywide transportation plan. Uh, the CTP, as we call it internally, is a long range uh, transportation planning document, and it has a number of goals and a number of programs that are within the CTP. Uh, some of those goals um, you see on the slide are accessibility, uh, multimodal transportation, um, cost effective, a safe transportation system. And related to this conversation, probably most importantly, is supportive of a healthy and clean environment. There are other programs within the CTP that include um, everything from pavement, uh, pavement maintenance and pavement evaluation. Uh, Harris County's Vision Zero program is a part of the CTP, and our equity and transportation study is a part of the CTP. Um, and relevant to today's conversation really is that there are, are uh, certain buckets, if you will, uh, of project categories here within the CTP. And one of those is the Environmental Enhancement Program. Um, and this program allocates um, funding from various projects that can be used uh, to basically satisfy the program requirements. So certain roadway projects uh, may fall into, can say, well, this, this project is using uh, low impact development and green infrastructure, or this project is using Envision to meet various program elements. So moving on to more of the types of projects that, that we're seeing over time uh, for green stormwater infrastructure. Um, I don't have a poll question, but I have a couple of discussion questions for you. And, and really that is, you know, are you involved or have you been involved in, in a green stormwater infrastructure project or are you currently involved? Um, and, it, and, and what concerns do you sort of hear uh, from your perspective? And the ones that I've heard a lot over time are, are really a, a set of myths. And I'm going to talk about those briefly. One, one myth has been that green infrastructure costs more than traditional development. And I'll tell you, it can. Uh, but in our experience, we haven't really spent more money doing green infrastructure as opposed to a traditional, um, a tr traditional infrastructure design. The second is that Maybe we don't, we don't know how to design those things. And again, going back to talking about, you know, how, how long have we been doing this in Houston when that was absolutely correct. People here didn't know anything about low impact development and now we do. So we've sort of crossed over the hurdle about, you know, knowing how to design it and knowing how to build it. And actually the building it part is, is the next bullet point where uh, do, do local contractors they can't build it. Um, but we find over time, you know, in Houston, we've been doing a lot of this and your, your typical local contractors um, can, can build, can successfully build those projects. Uh, the, the other is that those techniques are not understood, um, which again, over time, they are, they are now fairly well understood and that systems will fail in extreme events. And I'll tell you, I haven't seen, um, any green infrastructure system uh, have a major failure or really have any failure for that matter um, from ex the extreme weather events that, that we've talked about in this, in this seminar today. Uh, but the last one, and it's really the biggest, has been this conversation about maintenance. 
and and it's really a crutch. And the 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 reason why we keep talking about green infrastructure maintenance is because we really, I say we, but the collective we is just not wanting to maintain or is scared of maintaining green infrastructure. So to combat that or to overcome it, I should say internally, uh, what we're doing is we have a, a maintenance program established that is really looking comprehensively at all of our county owned stormwater quality features. And that happens to include those that we've built uh, that are low impact development and green infrastructure. And that program is working well for us. And I, I, what I would say is I think we're doing what um, other owners and maintainers of stormwater quality systems in Houston are doing. And that is there are, there are, there are contractors who do this every day, can, can come in and, <clears throat> and, and you know, inspect, maintain and repair any, any type of maintenance that's needed. And we expect this program would also apply to the um, uh, housing type projects that, that the county is looking at getting involved in, in the innovation zones. So let's talk a little bit about some project examples. Um, what I'll show you on the left, I, I like to show this slide because it shows you at a high level, a traditional roadway project on the left-hand side where you'd have four lane roadway, raised center median, in that detention basin here. Uh, and obviously you see this, this project that also crosses over um, a, a creek here. And on the right, you see a low impact development example where there isn't a, there isn't a detention basin. This, this little pond here thing is not, is not connected to this roadway at all. Uh, but you still have the four lanes. Um, and instead of that raised center median, you have the depressed center median section where your stormwater runoff from this project is handled in the median in lieu of having, a, having an adjacent detention basin here. Another example is you know, doing, doing these types of projects in a park. And this project is uh, a newly constructed Atascacita Park. It's in the Northeast side of Harris County. It's a beautiful place if, if you haven't been there. Uh, put it on your list. It's a Harris County Precinct 2 park facility, uh, and it's full of low impact development. So the parking lot here that you see in the picture drains to a bioswell system uh, here in the parking lot. Um, there's a great playground for, for kids that's, that's uh, tied in directly to, to the nature in the park here. And there's also a lot of uh, walking trails and a big part of the low impact development uh, development of this facility was the conservation and protection of a, um, a native lake wetland system that's that's actually uh, one of the one of the prettiest I've seen in Harris County. Another example of, of doing you know green infrastructure in a roadway. In this case, this is uh, Luetta Road in Northwest Harris County. It's a four lane roadway system. Uh, but what you see here is, is basically a bioretention basin system that is off of the roadway. So it's not, it's not in the, the lanes or in the median of the roadway here. Um, and it has, you know, just showing you another, another view of this project. So it looks like your overall roadway project, but it has the um, bioretention system that is, that is planted off, off to the side of the right of way and has been a very successful project for the county. Another example here is at the, at the intersection of Spring Cypress Road and Telgi Road. Um, this is the Precinct 4's Dragonfly Pond. So this, this project was actually a uh, kind of a partnership project with Harris County Flood Control District. The roadway improvements here needed a, a detention basin. And this, this location of the detention basin is across from a, a Precinct 4 park on Telgi Road uh, that, that has a lot of walking trails. And so the, the development of this pond kind of ties in with the adjacent park. And I like this project because every time I drive by it now, you really see the community out here. I always see people either walking, there's trail improvements going on in the, in the area here a lot of people that are fishing in the pond. 
and this this particular pond was designed uh, for the benefit of, of dragonfly habitat and so it has come out to be a really really nice project uh, for the community. And Holdreth Road, another example, this one's up uh, near the Tomball area in Harris County. Uh, this was a Harris County Precinct 4 project with a, a major roadway that leads to a new um, office facility and maintenance camp for the precinct, which that entire site development could be a separate, a separate uh, presentation altogether because of the way that it was designed using green infrastructure and the lead facility. It's a very, uh, very neat uh, site to visit. But the roadway here is low impact development and, and it includes four lanes as well with that center median uh, swale that we talked about. Uh, and one thing I'll mention is these photos were taken after the winter storm. So you see a lot of dormant veg vegetation, but nothing that had died, all, all the vegetation survived that, that um, the storm event because, because it was native in, in nature. And the photo on the left shows uh, a, like an 80 year old oak tree that actually was, was uh, preserved with the design of, of green infrastructure on this project. So I wanna take a minute and, and sort of walk you through a couple of examples of maybe what the future of green infrastructure could be in Houston and Harris County, uh, particularly to residential development. So what I'll say is these photos are not, these are not Harris County projects I'm gonna show you because <laughs> historically we don't do residential development. Uh, but I wanna show you what it could look like potentially in the innovation zones or even in other communities. And these are real, real examples. So in, in Northwest Harris County, Cypress, Texas, there's a Josie Lake Park. It's in the Bridgeland community. Um, and this, this photo shows you the, obviously a park environment here, but the infrastructure for the parking lot is here and that parking lot drains to this vegetated, you know, rain garden system, uh, which is a really nice example of another example of how you can incorporate multifunctional landscapes um, into different types of project designs. In this case, it's a park. Another example is uh, within Parkland Village. Um, there is a park within this community as well. So this one's uh, the park site in Parkland Village. But you see on, along the streets, you have these um, bioretention systems that uh, have curb cups, cuts in them to drain runoff from the streets as well as the park site. And you can see all the vegetation here within the swale system and adjacent to the park. Again, lots of, lots of community access to green infrastructure in this type of scenario. Um, and a lot of people that are using this, this park facility. And the, the second but most important thing that I would mention out of this example is really the, the home component here, the re residential aspect. Um, and here in this area, it's, it's, it's really the only one that I've seen uh, in our region where the homes are basically right there with the green, the green infrastructure elements as well. So similar to that park site along the street here, you, in this, the photo on the left, you've got homes that are basically fronting the green elements here uh, that are handling stormwater runoff on the project site. And with that, I'll uh, take any questions and comments. And again, I hope, I hope my, my role and I guess my purpose of the presentation was really to kind of show how green infrastructure can really span multiple sustainability programs. Um, and we look forward to continue using it in our, in our work at the county. Yeah, thanks a lot, Nick. Uh, we do have a couple of questions. I think first off, the easy one, uh, there is the Sustainable Sites Initiative. Um, that's kind of the lead for landscape. <laughs> uh, as the lead, uh, or sorry, the sites uh, uh, rating system, has that been integrated at all in anything y'all are doing yet? No, I, I'm familiar with it. I can't, off the top of my head, I can't think of a project that we have that that has used that. I, it, it, 
from a rating system standpoint, it, it, it does go hand in hand with a lot of the lead criteria, the lead for sites. Um, um, and so enough parallels that I think it, it's something that could be easily, you know, augmented and brought into, into what y'all are doing. So yeah, um, we'll take that back and we'll, we'll look at that. Uh, what have we learned from some of the older projects uh, that the county participated in? Um, you know, you've got some that have been on the ground for five, six, seven years now. Um, what what has come out of those that uh, either from a criteria standpoint or a performance, uh, what you what you would approve on the next project? Um, what have you learned? What have you learned? Well, I, I think I think over time, collectively, we've learned a lot. Right. Um, and, and and obviously, when you do some of these, when when you do your first project, there will, you, you, you do open the opportunity to have lessons learned. Um, so I don't, I wouldn't sugarcoat it and say, I've never had a project that, that had an issue. Um, I think we've learned a lot about protecting uh, green infrastructure systems throughout the construction project, because, you know, if you're expecting your, a vegetated system to sort of be here long-term, uh, you know, then you have to, number one, get through your entire construction and then, and then have the elements, uh, they're protected to and, and 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 establish them to be able to do the job that you're that you're trying to accomplish. So, I would say we've learned a lot of lessons like that. Um, we've learned lessons about um, you know how to maintain a green infrastructure. We've learned that you can, I mean, you can you can spend a lot of additional money in landscaping doing green projects, but at the same time. It doesn't have to be like that, right? So, you know, matching, matching, I guess, the the visual expectations of what you want your project to be uh, is important. Uh, and I would encourage everybody to do that. And I and I don't mean any of that in a negative way. Um, what else? I think I think over time, Chris, we've just all learned a lot more about, you know, how to design them, how to design these systems and, and how to build them. Right. Yeah, I think we have. <laughs> so, well, awesome. Uh, we're going to move on uh, sticking in the county. Uh, but uh, Nick, thank you so much. And there was one other thank question. You. I'm not quite sure I understood. So I think I'll encourage that person to uh, you see Nick's email address there. Uh, go ahead and ask your question directly to him. And uh, once again, thank you so much for your presentation today. Thank you. Like I say, we're sticking with a little bit of uh, theme in the county. And our next speaker is Alan Black, who is the interim director of Harris County Flood Control. Uh, we welcome uh, Alan to our presentations today. We're getting him logged in, starting. All right, there's the presentation. We up, can you hear me? There's Alan, how you doing, sir? I'm doing great, here, let me turn my video on too. I forgot I was supposed to do that. Let's see here. Video. Sorry, we had this all figured out earlier and then I forgot about it. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and get started while I get the, uh, the video going. Does that work? Absolutely, it's all, all yours. Great, well, uh, good morning. And, and of course, thanks for having me today. I, I saw a lot of familiar faces on the participants list and it's, it's you know, I really wish that we could uh, uh, see everybody in person, but uh, you know, this is the next best thing, I suppose. Um, I also wanted to note that, you know, flood control is obviously going through a little bit of a transition right now. Just look at my current interim title, but we've kept everything moving forward, which wouldn't be possible without the amazing staff that we have, some of which are here today. So pay attention, Jason, Jonathan, Robert, Scott, and Stephen. I may have to call you on you at some point to help me out here. Moving on to the next slide, there we go. I, a public service announcement, need to make sure that everybody's aware that yes, we are in hurricane season, but flooding season is year round. If you live in Harris County, you are at risk for flooding. So please get flood insurance. It's inexpensive and it's good insurance because again, if you live in Harris County, you are at risk. So the Harris County Flood Control District has a, a pretty straightforward mission, and that is to provide flood damage reduction projects that work with appropriate regard for community and natural values. And, and we do that in different ways across the county. Um, the county has 23 major watersheds. 
Uh, and that amounts to more than 2,500 linear miles of channel all across the county. And as I mentioned, each watershed has its own unique characteristics and as a result has its own unique solutions. So when we put together our list of bond program projects, um, of channel modifications, stormwater detention, uh, channel maintenance, storm repairs, home buyouts, and studies to help position us for the efforts that we'll need to do even beyond the bond program. So when voters approved the bond program in August 25th, 2018, it came with a commitment from Harris County Flood Control District to take a $2.5 billion voter approved bond and seek every opportunity for other people's money and try and double that money into a nearly $5 billion portfolio of projects. And that amounts to 181 projects across all of those watersheds and 38 of which actually were added as a result of input from the community. But talking about that partnership funding, and it's been a lot of talk in the last six months about it. The, the federal government doesn't just write big fat checks and say, go do good work. Instead, they fill money up into lots of different programs and funds that you have to apply for. Uh, this is, if you've seen me speak before, then, then you've seen this slide. I like to call this the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the federal, excuse me, the, the, the spaghetti model of federal funding. Um, it's, not, it, it's not simple, but this is the only way that we can try and simplify a complicated process. So on the left are the different programs and the different agencies we work with. And on the right is the type of work that we can do. And I'm not gonna go through the details here. I've actually given hour and a half dissertations on this one slide alone, but it starts with the county and our property taxes, which were, uh, were recently approved yesterday for, uh, for the fiscal year. Uh, but there's a state of Texas, Augie mentioned about the flood infrastructure fund. Of course, we work with the Corps of Engineers uh, we work with the United States Department of Agriculture, Ag, who knew, right? It's actually the Natural Resource Conservation Service that helps us out. There's a ton of different programs under FEMA. Um, a lot of people have heard recently about Department of Housing and Urban Development through the Texas General Land Office, and then even other programs like the Economic Development Administration. So we truly do leave no stone unturned in pursuing those federal funds. And while we've had some success, what, uh, what happened in March was kind of a snapshot in time uh, report to commissioners court on how we were doing. Um, and we made it about halfway, but we were still about $1.2 billion short. So flood control district worked with the, the what's now the, the county administrator uh, and, and OMB, the Office of Management and Budget, to develop a plan for a backstop. And that resulted in, in commissioner's court approving in, uh, in June, uh, what is called the Flood Resilience Trust. And that started with an initial influx of mobility related transfers of $540 million, and then also establishing a $40 million annual transfer of Hectra surplus funds also to be used to all, to, to all told be able to provide uh, assurance and certainty that every project in the flood control district bond program will be built, even if a partner doesn't show up. And the way we're managing that is first and foremost that it does not eliminate the need for partner participation. We are still pursuing as much federal support as we possibly can. Uh, look at the $750 million in CDBG mitigation funds that the GLO recently included in their, um, their amendment to the state action plan. So we're still working closely with them and how to process through that uh, very complicated uh, uh, process to achieve those, those dollars, but we won't see those probably for another, another year or so. So at the same time, uh, while we're continuing every single one of our, 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 our bond projects, um, if we reach a point where we've run out of local funds and we cannot proceed without that partner and it has not shown up, that's when we invoke the Flood Resilience Trust. In accordance with the bond prioritization framework, we say, okay, I can't move any further without funds right now. Um, can we use the Flood Resilience Trust? We have a series of approvals to go through, in which case we can continue moving forward, even while still, again, uh, seeking other partnership funds where available. So to date, where are we on those 181 projects? We have initiated every single one of them. Um, that doesn't mean $5 billion in projects are gonna start next week. 
um, our average project life cycle is anywhere between three and five years. And so by initiate, that means in some cases, we're just now starting the planning process for that. It may be several years before we even get to uh, final design and right away acquisition and, and construction, but at least we've got every single one of those projects underway. Of the two and a half billion dollars of local funds that was approved by voters, we've committed at this point about 650 million. Hadn't all been spent, but we've committed it, encumbered it, and it's sitting on projects so we can do our good work. Snapshot again, I mentioned that our, our in total, we've secured about $1.2 billion in partnership funds. That's about 1.1 billion on the federal side, federal and state side, and then about 100 at the, at the local level. So our local partners are stepping up as well. We've done a ton of work, service contracts awarded. Those are professional service agreements. We've got about $251 million out of the bond program currently working in design with our, with our consultants. We've also awarded $552 million in construction contracts since Hurricane Harvey. Now, by comparison, prior to Harvey and prior to the bond election, the flood control district was funded in some total at $120 million a year. And we split that evenly between our O&M and capital. So we went from a $60 million CIP annually to what is effectively now a $500 million annual CIP through the bond program. It's, you pick which cliche you want. It's been like building a plane mid-flight, changing the tires, driving down the road. Um, we've, we've really accomplished a tremendous amount. And again, I, cannot, I could not be more proud of the, uh, the team behind me making sure all these projects move forward. One of the things that stands out of what I believe one of the proudest parts of our change and, and building a, a huge uh, bond program and executing is the community engagement effort. Um, prior to the, the bond election, we simply didn't have the resources that we do now to be able to reach out to the community, engage with them, explain what we understand, hear their concerns, what they are concerned about, what they're seeing on the ground around their homes. To date, we've held 150 bond program community engagement meetings, more than 12,000 registered attendees, uh, more than 8,000 comments received, a lot of feedback. We're getting a lot of hits on our website, a lot of followers on Twitter and, and Facebook. And, and I'm really, really proud of the efforts so far and our efforts to continue engaging with the community. Now, the work that we do, let's talk a little bit about those solutions and what they really aren't limited to anymore these days. Um, you know, you look back 25 years ago and the work we would do is we'd build a base and it'd be, it'd be rectangular and it would be dry and it would be grass and that would be it. Or you look at the traditional uh, Corps of Engineers projects, we work with them on the concrete line channels. That's not all what we do these days. And in fact, that's more the exception as opposed to the rule of what we do these days. So our toolbox has expanded to where the technology and regulations have progressed, so have we in updating our policies and procedures accordingly. We've developed and improved upon nature-based solutions over time, allowing us to integrate projects that work with appropriate guard for community and natural values. Shown here, we've got a couple of examples of, of our design guidelines using those nature-based techniques. We stabilize stream banks, enhance water quality in our detention basins, and it helps our staff and contractors identify vegetation that is native and desirable versus invasive or undesirable. We can't use those all the time, but we do where we can. And all of these, I would say, are, are available on our website for download. But I want to talk a little bit about specifically our wet bottom basin, as if we're, if we're talking about stormwater quality. Now, there are two basic things that we can do with stormwater to help reduce the risk of flooding in each area. And we can move the stormwater more quickly down the channel through channel modifications, which we still have to mitigate, uh, or we can store it in the stormwater detention basin. And there's several ways that that basin can fill up, but all of our structures are passive designs that utilize gravity to operate. I always say that gravity is our friend. You know, we want to use mother nature as opposed to somebody sitting on a, on a valve to decide when the water gets released. We use gravity and passive design. And this illustration is showing how water overflows into a basin from the right. The water comes up into the channel on the right, flows over what we call a weir, and then fills up that basin, is safely held there for a period of time, and then slowly released back into the channel. 
but we can do so much more with those detention basins. We also work with other agencies in shared jurisdiction over flooding issues in Harris County. You've probably heard a lot, of, a lot that there are three different types of flooding in, in Harris County. There's local flooding, riverine flooding, and coastal flooding. Well, flood control focuses on riverine flooding, but the local flooding goes to the local jurisdictions, such as the city of Houston. Now imagine on the left side, uh, that's where you may have a, a neighborhood that was built a long time ago and, and the, the, the storm sewers were simply undersized. They're not big enough for the sorts of, of rainfall that we're uh, experiencing these days. So the city of Houston or a mud may come to us and say, we'd like to make those pipes bigger um, to allow the water to get out of the neighborhood faster and alleviate some of that local flooding. Well, you can't just push all that water straight out into the, the channel on the right or the creek or bio on the right. So we build these stormwater detention basins in the middle to hold that water and slowly release it into the, the channel. But the municipality like the city will also uh, uh, want to perhaps work with us to, uh, to sponsor some recreation op opportunities. So we're happy to do that. Flood control can't do it uh, with our own funds, but we're happy to recognize that 99% of the time, those basins are land that aren't being used to hold water. And so we work with them to sponsor on recreation opportunities such as trails or maybe even ball fields down in the bottom if there happens to be a, a dry bottom basin in that case. But we also implement other techniques such as natural stable channel design. And this is an example, this particular channel is an example of where we did that up in the Cypress Creek watershed. This is Pilo Gully, uh, just east of 249, north of Cypress Creek, where we needed to make some repairs, badly needed repairs to the channel. And we had the right of way to be able to incorporate natural shape, st stable channel design. And what we mean by that, it incorporates various techniques, such as uh, natural logs, buried logs, tow wood and live stakes, and pools and riffles to help with the water quality. So we're accomplishing a lot of different things all at the same time. If you ask me a specific question about this, I am definitely going to punt it to Jonathan Hawley. So Jonathan, be ready on the mic if, uh, if, if necessary. But we also, and this is another one that really falls under Jonathan's uh, area of expertise, but we're experimenting with floating treatment wetlands. This is a, a joint effort with U of H Clear Creek to assess the water treatment capabilities of floating treatment wetlands. We've got these deep uh, basins that hold water permanently. Well, maybe we can float some wetlands out over top of that to help treat the water that's sitting there in the, uh, the, the wet basin. So the initial basin testing site was actually on the U of H Clear Lake campus. And the initial results were showing some, turbid, some reductions in turbidity and bacteria. We're now extending that study to a new site on a basin we're currently constructing on Clear Creek. That'll add an additional 3,300 square feet, and it's also testing new anchoring systems. So we're continuing to monitor the, the, the effectiveness of the, the water quality treatment, as well as pushing it again to find new ways that we can implement and anchor these systems throughout the, uh, the county. That's not the only thing that we do uh, that's a little bit out thinking differently in terms of you know, our traditional uh, channels and basins, but Sometimes we also need to look towards floodplain preservation. It's one of our tools to reduce the risk of flooding. And there's really two different principles involved. First is to keep undeveloped property within the floodplain from being developed in the first place, which might ultimately also be part of a flood control capital project in the future. Now this includes property we use for our wetlands mitigation program, as well as our flooding easement program. But floodplain preservation also applies to our home buyout program where there's, there's really no feasible engineered project that would reduce the risk of flooding. So we work with voluntary homeowners to, to relocate them to higher ground out of harm's way. It eliminates future flood damages and risk to health and, and safety for, our, for the owners and rescuers, frankly. It reduces the repetitive subsidized flood insurance payments and it restores floodplain to its natural and beneficial function. Finally, it can create open space with the potential for community amenities like you know, parks and, and gardens and, and playing fields. The last thing I want to touch on is our map next effort. And this, um, it, 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 it's somewhat on the radar now with the recent rollout of FEMA's risk rating 2.0, which is a separate effort that 
The FEMA risk rating 2.0 is, is intended to establish more equity in how rates are specific, how insurance rates and premiums are specifically established from one home to the next. But our effort called MAP Next is to use the latest and greatest cutting edge technology to better represent to the public what their risk of flooding is. Um, people are familiar with a 100 year floodplain and sometimes they think if I'm not in the 100 year floodplain, I'm not at risk of flooding. Go back to the first slide I just show, I showed at the beginning. If you live in Harris County, you are at risk for flooding. And so our MAP Next efforts are intended to help better represent those risks to each individual homeowner. That's a long, term effort that we've been working on since Hurricane Harvey. Uh, we kicked it off in 2019 and we're almost done with our models. Uh, we expect to transmit those to FEMA in the January timeframe. And that'll kick off about a 18 to 24 month process of FEMA review, public input, FEMA response, and then ultimately adopting those, uh, flood, those, those flood maps uh, across Harris County. So a lot more to come on those. Uh, you, can, you can expect to see sometime mid next year that public comment period uh, where that information will start to be rolled out and you'll see what we're, what we're seeing, what our models are showing. But again, cutting edge technology, some of the first in the country using rain on grid modeling with, uh, with the latest LIDAR. So we're, we're excited to, uh, to move this to the next step and get these over to FEMA for review. Uh, with that, I've, I've hit a whole lot of, uh, of different subjects. I know I've kind of bounced around a bit but we always wanna hear from you. Here's how you can reach out to us. Uh, of course, I'll be happy to answer any questions y'all may have here as well. I know we're running short on time, but, uh, but again, I'll open it up to any, any questions. Alan, thank you so much. And, and thanks for showing everybody the, uh, the design guidelines and opportunities that flood control has, um, has been developing. Uh, th we're a long way from the old trapezoidal designs at this point, and I appreciate that. I know I know that our organization appreciates that. And um, we've got a couple of questions. That real quick, um, let's let's go to this one about uh, the ability to uh, to do buyouts uh, more quickly after a flood event. Um, the more mapping that we've done, the more we understand how our watersheds work and where the flooding occurs or has occurred. Do you think we can speed up uh, these these buyouts to get people into new homes quicker? I, that's a great question, and uh, and it's things that we are working on. Um, but honestly, in order to speed up federally funded buyouts, that would require legislation, uh, congressional legislation. Um, okay. We aren't able to move forward with any 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 expenditures where we expect federal reimbursement until we've received uh, approval of that grant. Um, uh, Congresswoman Fletcher, uh, last congressional session, um, uh, 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 prepared and, and, and actually met, had some good progress on some legislation that could help us on that. It, it didn't make it to, uh, to the president's desk. We're hopeful that similar efforts may, uh, may come forward in the, in the future, but it's really going to re rely on Congress to be able to allow us to do that. I see. Okay. Uh, this is an interesting question, <clears throat> one I hadn't thought of before, really, uh, about engagement of, of the community in, in helping to understand, uh, you know, where flooding has occurred, where issues are occurring, and, and the question was asked from the standpoint of what can we do maybe to engage high school students who, uh, you know, have, you know, they're, they're the ones that can do social networking better than any of us here today, right? Uh, so maybe there's a way to to use that portion of the community to gain information that might help you in, in additional analyzation? There, there, there's two parts uh, to my response there. The first is the, the practical that's already out there, and that is, A, of course, you can call Harris County Flood Control District, go to our website, submit information, but the, uh, the, the, the state of Texas stood up all the way, all across the, 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 the state, regional flood planning groups. And we are in the San Jacinto Regional Flood Planning Group. And I'll send a website to y'all uh, through the chat or, or later on how you yep. can get to this, but they've got an interactive map. They're asking for that exact kind of information. They've got a great interactive map. You can drop a pin, you can talk, tell them what the issue is, and all that will not only be uh, be ingested into the, the regional flood planning efforts that they're undertaking, but flood control district will have access to that information as well. The second part of that is the outreach to the schools, both at, you know, not just high schools, but middle schools and elementary schools. I'd love 
to get to the point someday where we've got a, a rolling road show that can go all the way around and 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 cater each of our presentations not only to the uh, to the age group but also to the watershed that those those schools are in. Um, that's going to take a little bit more resources, but it's something that I think could pay dividends. Uh, immensely in the future, because one of the things we're trying, we, we continue to try and, and, and get the word out on is individuals need to have a, an idea of what their flood risk is. They need to understand what it means to live in the Cypress Creek watershed versus what it means to live in the, the, the Braised Bayou watershed. And so that's a great place to start is in the elementary, middle school and high schools. So hopefully we can, uh, can find the resources to start moving that forward sometime in the future. Yeah, and uh, so there's a question that I actually know the answer to, but I'll let you answer it. Uh, as these buyouts uh, are occurring, um, what is happening to make sure that when uh, properties are, are uh, taken and, and used now for uh, uh, purposes other than, than single family, they're converted into parks and whatever, but when we move those residences, uh, what kind of emphasis is there being put on doing those as affordable communities? So, and, and that's, there is a very complicated uh, uh, question because there's a lot of moving pieces. Um, many of the, the LMI areas that we're trying to build flood damage reduction projects in, um, the homes have been built right up to the, to the channels. And so in some cases, we need, to buy, we need to buy homes just to build our projects. Well, mm -hmm. those communities have been there for, for generations. You know, the, the, the families have been there for generations. And we need there to be affordable housing within that same area. And that's where there's that combination of funds that were appropriated to the general land off to the Texas General Land Office in September of 2017 for housing recovery. You know, those funds are also intended to help build new uh, new housing that's out of, of risk. But at the same time, the, the, the money that the Congress appropriated to the GLO uh, for in, in February of 2018 was for mitigation. Well, our argument has been that those funds should be coming to Harris County and to the city of Houston to help protect the investments that are being made to the communities through the housing funding. So you're going to spend all this money to, to let the, help the housing recovery, uh, but then you're not going to spend the money to, to keep that, those damages from happening again in the future. So that's a big argument, a big discussion that's been ongoing. Uh, there's no simple answer to it, but we are cognizant of the fact that those things do go hand in hand. If you, if you move people out of harm's way, you got to put them somewhere and they need to be in a place that's sustainable and resilient for, 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 for their community. Yeah, and there are there are a handful of projects that are currently underway by the county that 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 is exactly what they're they're trying to do. The county purchases land and then uh, develops uh, for for LMI properties. So that's that's uh, at least that's a start. And we're trying to figure out exactly how that's going to work more uh, in the future. So uh, final question, because this I, I, I was going to move on, but I love the question because uh, it speaks directly to our mission uh, to celebrate, protect and restore our, our bayous. And this is the restore question. Uh, what kind of plans do we have to convert some of the, the concrete channelized uh, trapezoidal features into uh, something um, as we've seen to great effect that it has a, 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 you know, a better emphasis on green infrastructure, more ability to have recreation integrated into the solution and and providing more stormwater protection flow, uh, you know, out of the out of the uh, harm's way and into the ship channel. So th those are questions we can and do ask as those channels are st reach the end of their uh, their, their life cycle. Um, the, the difficulty is that and, and, and again, I say difficulty It's not an impossibility, but some of the difficulty lies in the fact that Concrete line channels oftentimes are concrete lined because that's the only way to keep the slope stable. And so removing those concrete, that concrete lining is going to require alternate methods to keep those, in some cases, very steep slopes stable. Now, traditionally, that would mean laying those slopes out a little bit more, making them a bit more gradual. But you know what that requires? Right of way. And mm -hmm. so the costs start going up pretty high. And so we've obviously got far more flood risk reduction projects uh, that need funding than we have funding available. And it's the same message here as it is across the country. There's always more need than there is money to help address those needs. And so we have to balance those efforts based on what we also need to accomplish across the county. So as those, those, those channels reach the end of their life cycle, absolutely we can and do look at the possibility of re restoring those to a, a more natural channel. 
but there's going to be a, 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 a balancing act that we have to make in terms of cost and impact to the community. You know, if I acquire additional right of way, I'm probably acquiring more homes. And so now I've got to figure out where those folks are going to live in an area where the, the housing market is, is, a, is pretty tight. So everything is interconnected and it's a matter of trying to make sure that you balance it and don't have any unintended consequences. Yep, exactly. Well, Alan, uh, I think we're going to need to move on. Uh, there's a couple more questions. Perhaps you would look in the chat and maybe you can answer those directly yourself. Uh, really appreciate your time today and your presentation. Great info from Harris County Flood Control. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks, y'all. Uh, once again, a real quick bio break is on our schedule. Um, do believe that we'll honor that uh, just for any, everyone's benefit. Let's do this as a three minute break, please. Uh, once again, you'll see those uh, videos uh, coming in uh, during the break. Uh, this particular one sponsored by GSI Environmental and also Mr. Tom Bacon. So thank you so much to them for their sponsorship. Uh, watch these short videos, uh, take a quick bio break, and we'll be right back with our, our final presentations of the day. Great, welcome back. Uh, we'll finish strong here, switching gears to City of Houston. And we have a uh, very pre pleased to uh, have our next two speakers, uh, Carol Haddock, who's the Director of uh, Public Works for City of Houston, and also Laura Patino, who is the Interim Chief Resilience Officer for the City of Houston. Uh, I see them on my screen. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Uh, thanks for being here. Sorry, we're running a little bit late, but uh, we're not going to cut anyone short. We hope that all of our attendees will uh, take another maybe 20 minutes out of their lunch. Uh, looks like we're going to go past 12 o'clock, but uh, the floor is uh, the floor is yours. Uh, welcome back, Carol, and uh, good to see you, Laura. Thank you. Hi, Chris. Thank you for having us here today, and uh, thank you for the introduction. What a pleasure it is to be here uh, concluding today's program and sharing a little bit about uh, green infrastructure in Houston. So, and good morning, I'm Carol Haddock. Um, today, Laura and I are gonna share with you a little bit about what's going on with green infrastructure in the city of Houston. We're gonna do this a little bit different. We're gonna kind of do it as conversational style. 
um, um, rather than a formal presentation. So Laura, I'm gonna let you kick us off. Thanks, yeah, we'll have a, a few reference slides, um, but uh, like I said, we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about our perspective in what we've done over the couple, uh, last couple of years in integrating green infrastructure within our built environment. Um, so I first wanted to talk about today's theme, and we've heard the importance about green from multiple speakers today. And as a city continues to grow, uh, the efforts that we're doing regionally and locally play such an important and significant role in helping us uh, adapt and build resilience. And so when we talk about green and is good, I say, you know, green is great. And we've heard about the region, we've heard about what the county and what Harris County Flood Control are doing. And so uh, we'll explain a little bit more on the city. Uh, but before we do dig into that, I just want to put out a rhetorical question here um, about what you think about uh, when resilience is mentioned. And most of us think about the ability to bounce back. Um, the ability to withstand challenges, the ability to adapt. Um, what better way to do that and what better way to learn than from nature? So I'm going to share here this really um, interesting graphic. And, um, you know, when we think about uh, how Houston has grown uh, for a city that has fully developed or little green spaces available, we have to get a little creative and a little innovative in how we integrate nature. Houston has grown over 667 miles in the past 175 years. And most of that development um, uh, has covered all of our green, green environment, our prairies, our forests, uh, our green space. So uh, this graphic is just uh, shows us the extent of how we have expanded. Um, and since, for the last 10 years, Houston has started a slow transition to incorporate nature uh, within our environment. So nature um, does allow us to capitalize on the cascading benefits for individuals. Uh, the ecosystem services that small green infrastructure projects provide at all scales can bring um, hazard mitigation benefits, uh, health, economic, and quality of life benefits. But it can also bring environmental benefits too by improving air quality and water quality. So another rhetorical question, why is it so important in Houston and what have we done to advance this? Uh, today, earlier, we heard about um, Mayor Turner and talking about a few of the main actions that we as a city are doing and some of the marquee projects that have uh, moved forward and that will uh, demonstrate at a larger scale how uh, the city can lead by example. But in order to understand why we're here, it's important to understand our system. And really to understand our past. And um, Laura's putting up a slide for me here. You know, Houston's past, our present and our future, our future really is, it's tied to these, these bayou systems, these waterways. We have over 22 different watersheds that go through our city. We are the Bayou City. And while um, we think of it as flood control, flood damage reduction is the primary responsibility for water once it reaches the main channels. We also recognize that, that the city of Houston, we're responsible for, for basically once it leaves your private property from when it reaches the curb to the street, to the drain, to the storm sewer or that roadside ditch or, or anything that, that we take to get it there, um, there, there used to be a, a, a video on who owns the raindrop all the way into that, the outfall of that larger channel. And to do that, we, we have a separate storm sewer system. Uh, many cities in the Northeast have, actually have a combined system and their, their wastewater and their storm drainage is combined in the same system. We are fortunate that our system was built separately uh, to begin with and we've can, you know, and, and now state and federal laws require all systems to be built separately, but we didn't have to deal with that, that history. But we have over 100,000 inlets, drains, 3,800 miles of storm sewer pipes, 2,500 miles of storm ditches. Did, we do actually have a few detention basins. Sometimes the county has most of them, but we have a few. And when we look at our existing system, 
really we were built in the traditional way of handling stormwater run it off fast um, sometimes put an attention base in gray infrastructure capture it you know get get it out of the way we thought of rain as is more of a nuisance than necessarily as a benefit and there wasn't much integration of green and gray even though we had some green demonstration projects and some green projects in the area they really weren't um they were they were spots in time they weren't integrated into our overall approach but one of the things that we know that our rainfall is going to continue not only to increase in intensity it's going to increase in quantity and that as our city continues to grow that we, we must find ways to integrate um these 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 green and gray and that we need to find ways that we can live with water we need to capture our water where it falls we need to slow it down we need to make a find a way for all of our systems to be integrated in a way that that they complement our existing drainage system but that as we build forward that we're actually building better systems in into and co cooperating with our existing drainage system that's right director and it's 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 really interesting that you mention living with water in 2018 at the one year anniversary of hurricane harvey uh, the city launched the Resilience Office with the goal of developing a comprehensive strategy for resilience. And the strategy was released in February of 2020. And since then, we have tremendous, made tremendous progress to um, move forward with the specific goals and targets that are within the strategy. The strategy is focused on how Houstonians and families and businesses, the city and the region, uh, can take action at all of these different scales, individual, neighborhood, bayou, city and region. And so the focus of nature-based solutions is um, primarily spread out uh, throughout every chapter, but green infrastructure in the bayous, and I think something that's really interesting that was identified through several workshops when we worked with, in the city work with all of the stakeholders in putting together their strategy, is how green stormwater infrastructure and our, and our bayous are uh, interconnected and important. And so Resilience Houston does recognize this and has its own chapter for bayou specific actions. And one of the key elements of Resilient Houston is living with water. Uh, this effort was initiated through uh, in parallel through the resilience strategy through a series of workshops that culminated in specific actions that included and base uh, green infrastructure solutions in three distinct neighborhoods um, that have three completely distinct, distinct flooding challenges. And these are Independence Heights, Greens Point, and Cashmere Gardens. And what we learned through that effort of living with water is that there is no one size fits all solution. Every neighborhood has its own flooding challenges, but then also has additional climate related challenges that we must address, along with their all their vulner, social vulnerability factors. So it, it, that um, effort has provided a framework in order for the city to build off of a green stormwater infrastructure program that is currently advancing and being integrated at all levels. And so talking about that infrastructure, um, one of the questions we get asked is what have we done since Hurricane Harvey? And when you really stop and think about it, we've invested over nearly $800 million um, in infrastructure to adapt to our changing climate um, since Hurricane Harvey. Uh, we've, we've actually completed 42 capital improvement projects. Uh, we have an additional nine that are currently in construction, totaling more than $500 million in capital projects investment in our drainage system. We have 124 local drainage projects. These are targeted small projects, um, direct neighborhoods, immediate benefits, $21 million by the end of this fiscal year and an additional 40 projects will be completed. They're, they're, they're small projects, so usually less than $3 million in cost. And because of that, we can get them um, scoped, designed and in the ground much faster than we can do larger capital projects. We also have 124 SWAP projects that have been constructed, uh, just under 35 million. Uh, the SWAP projects are, are an interesting combination because uh, the council district offices actually help um, identify um, on the ground from input areas that we need to go look. Um, an additional 18 are in construction and, and, or in design and they should be complete by the end of this fiscal year. 
so that we'll have 142 projects on the ground by the end of this fiscal year. We have six large scale TERS, um, our interagency projects. Um, a lot of people say, well, the TERS in the city, but the TERS is the city. The TERS is that tax increment, that ad valorem tax increment that would otherwise be coming into infrastructure the city implemented, but is actually being implemented through the TERS. We work hand in hand, exceeding 33 million um, and three more in project in construction right now, adding another 76 million in investments for drainage infrastructure. 10 project properties have been acquired for detention. Uh, it's nearly $70 million that we've spent on that and almost 360 acres of land that will be available for adding detention. Uh, we have $120 million combination of funding from federal and state funds resulting in the dredging of 3 million cubic yards of sand from the West Fork of the San Jacinto River uh, in the upstream reaches of Lake Houston. But it doesn't stop there. Um, these are primarily gray infrastructure solutions, and we've also advanced policies on uh, improving resilience in, des in design criteria, improving resilience in building codes, and policies on investments for green infrastructure. So um, in August of 2019, uh, the city released the incentives for green development. And by the end of August of this year, we have actually implemented three out of the four incentives. Um, these are the tax abatement program for green stormwater infrastructure, uh, an awards and recognition program, and um, an expedited permitting review cycle. By the way, uh, the applications for the awards and recognition program uh, are being taken until October 15th. So if, if you have projects that you want uh, to be recognized for, if you know of projects that are good examples, um, I highly encourage you to participate and submit an application um, and feel free to contact me with any questions. Um, but these are all incentives for the private sector and the city wants to continue to lead by example. So in Resilient Houston and uh, in the City Climate Action Plan, we have set specific goals and actions that aim to advance the integration of green stormwater infrastructure. Um, the first is to uh, remove all habitable structures from the floodway by making room for water and gain back green space. Um, so this is essentially to the point of um, what Alan uh, was speaking about in making room for water and acquiring more right of way. And so the opportunity there is what can we do with those green spaces that can uh, essentially serve multiple purposes for the community. The second goal is to complete 100 green stormwater infrastructure projects uh, by 2025. And in one year uh, since the launch of the strategy, we've already completed 30 in the city of Houston. And these are both private and public demonstration projects, as well as uh, projects that are larger scale that, that have been integrated. So we continue to track that. And so with this trajectory, we are well on our way to meet our goal by 2025. Another goal that we have related to green infrastructure is to plant 4.6 million trees by 2030. And that's roughly two trees per Houstonian. Um, so we have we have some time, but we also need to make sure that we, we continue to advance and work with our partners, work with our park, depart, park department, work with public works um, to, to identify where these trees are going, where they're actually going to have a flood reduction benefit, a heat mitigation benefit, as well as ensuring that they are uh, being prioritized uh, in an equitable manner. Um, so I am going to open yet another slide for us to, to go through, um, because it touches a little bit on how green infrastructure and the importance of green infrastructure is for not only mitig mitigation, uh, but also adaptation and how when integrated within our projects, uh, it can actually have a, a tremendous impact in, in helping achieve our goals. So th thanks, Laura. So, and I really do wanna talk about because um, one of the things that we're doing in the Department of Public Works is we're really looking at all those opportunities to integrate that green stormwater infrastructure. 
Um, we sometimes we say it's within parks and detention basins, um, but it's also, you know, along our street rights of ways and everything so to create those dual purpose facilities. They bring multiple benefits to the communities. Um, some places it may be a soccer field uh, that uh, when it's raining and you wouldn't be out playing anyhow can be part of a, a detention basin. Sometimes it's a constructed wetlands and parks. Um, we also work with resilience to review our design standards um, for green water green stormwater, but also across all of it, uh, whether it's our pavements, whether it's um, um, our cross sections, looking at all those things. And we look for ways to identify and bring the implementation of green stormwater infrastructure to, to some of those most vulnerable areas where there's a second compound risk, cascading impacts. Um, if we can solve for more than one thing when we're out there, we need to do that every time. And so part of the work that we're doing at the city is to ensure that our recovery funding is utilizing, utilized to build forward. For example, through the Hurricane Harvey recovering the large scale infrastructure projects, uh, the Inwood Detention Basin located in the Acres Homes community is being designed to create a series of detention basins instead of just designing holes as we've typically done. And this is a, a great project that's been in partnership with the Harris County Flood Control District, the Parks Board, and the, and the community, the Near Northwest Management District and the actual communities out there to design a recreational space that involves nature, provides these green stormwater benefits and amenities that the community will enjoy. But not only just transforming a, a, an old golf course, um, in, into something new, but transforming it into an area where the community continue to have access to nature and can continue to enjoy this as an amenity. Um, and so it's exciting when we, can, when we can do these things in partnership and we can work with the community to meet their needs at the same time. Laura? Yeah, and an, another example of how that's being integrated is through specifically planning studies and how they can be integrated within sidewalks, uh, streets, and trails, and like I mentioned, what to do with the buyout areas. Um, and we're using Harvey Recovery funding as well to kick off and advance these efforts. Um, we've even gotten to the point of integrating green stormwater infrastructure in our multifamily developments that are being subsidized by the city and moving forward. Um, and so the resilience office has worked with the housing department to develop a resilience matrix that includes GSI implementation uh, for these projects. So anything that's related to green roofs, rain barrels and cisterns, uh, permeable pavement uh, and bioswells that are being incorporated in those developments. So as we implement Resilient Houston, and the incentives for green development, it's important to recognize that there's a transition into the skill sets for design maintenance and operations of these systems. Um, we haven't done this in the past. Uh, green stormwater infrastructure offers opportunities for new jobs as we work on climate adaptation. And for that reason, Envision training is being explored for city staff. We have a number of city staff that are already trained uh, in building capacity for our maintenance crews through our various pilot projects. Uh, for example, in our urban prairie project, a training and education components being created as part of the pilot in which our crews will be able to use the space for understanding how to best take care of the prairie, the wetland systems, and the new green stormwater investments in the city so that we can expand that knowledge to other city assets as they come online. Yeah, and one other really important thing as we talk about um, green infrastructure and the transition is that we have to acknowledge one uh, very important factor and that's green infrastructure is only a tool in our toolbox to address stormwater, uh, mitigate heat and other factors. But we have to continue to explore how best to implement it with more data and to do so in an equitable manner. Um, I think for the past few years, we have been able to observe the importance and the shortcomings of our infrastructure and they've been very apparent. And so we do have in the upcoming years, a uh, once in a generation opportunity to transform uh, our infrastructure with billions of dollars that are coming in from federal state and local, uh, local funding, local support. Um, we can leverage the ongoing implementation of these projects, but we must embrace and integrate green infrastructure solutions and codify the standards that we talked about, forge the partnerships and continue to work together with our partners to improve um, our maintenance priorities and better manage our resources. Um, and of course, we must have to do so by prioritizing uh, populations and communities that are at the highest risk and have the highest vulnerability 
not just on climate hazards, but uh, other measures as well that indicate their ability to recover. So director, I'll, I'll hand it over to you to close us off and then um, we'll, we'll be available for questions. It's excellent. So, and I, and I will say beyond these demonstration projects, green stormwater implementation at scale will need to have, it, it will need to be very place-based strategy. The locations will need to be determined with an equity lens um, to ensure that all neighborhoods benefit from this infrastructure public uh, green stormwater infrastructure projects should, should consider stormwater management needs, but also the impacts on and the benefits to the neighborhoods, economic development, quality of life. Um, but it's transformation from how we normally do things. It's, um, you're gonna hear this a lot. Uh, I heard it in the, the speakers from the county this morning. You're gonna hear it from us. Um, we are looking at equity as integrated into how we set priorities for where we make and how much infrastructure investment we make. We've talked about this in our different goals and the advances in policy and inclusion within our systems throughout specific investments. Really, the only way that we're going to get climate ready and resilient is by having these conversations about every dollar that we invest. We need to talk about policy, we need to talk about investments, we need to talk about partnerships, and we need to talk about financing. All of these aspects are necessary to move forward um, and implement good solutions, implement green solutions, and to implement sustainable and resilient solutions. And we have to be careful because uh, you can be uh, sustainable but not resilient, you can be resilient but not sustainable, and so how do we make sure that everything that we're doing is for both? Uh, and so Laura and I are, are on here for a little while longer to answer questions as people have them. Excellent. Thank you both so much. Uh, yeah, I do have a couple of questions. Let's talk about uh, the Urban Prairie Project. What, what's the typical size of, of one of those projects? Are those happening? Is that more of an infill, like, a, a, for instance, an abandoned house? Uh, you know, might leave a tract vacant, or are we talking about doing something larger that's adjacent to, you know, one of the bayous or a city facility? So Laura, this one's been your bread and butter. So jump right in there. It is. So um, the answer is a little bit of both in the sense that we are starting with one particular project, which uh, we receive funding for through the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation in Wells Fargo and are in partnership with New Hope Housing and Star of Hope. Um, the specific uh, cornerstone community, which is off of uh, in, in, in South Houston, off of 288, uh, adjacent to the Sunnyside Complete Community, um, was redeveloped and it is now a whole campus uh, serving uh, for transitional housing as well as permanent housing for uh, women and children. And there is a detention pond in the back of that property that um, is it was designed and is designed in a traditional stormwater uh, detention as a traditional stormwater detention basin. When you look at maps of what uh, that area looked like 50, 60, 100 years ago, it was all prairie. And so part of what we're trying to do is showcase how to take an area that has been developed and return the prairie to that area. Uh, while also ensuring that we still meet the same stormwater benefits and then provide additional cascading benefits to the community. Um, similarly, we're looking to uh, partner um, with uh, other organizations uh, where we can, and, and within our own department as well, to identify where there are vacant lots, smaller lots, to expand on the opportunity of uh, pocket prairies. And so those are gonna look entirely different because it's looking at a different type of development and different types of, of land usage for where we could uh, incorporate prairie or specific green stormwater infrastructure elements at a much smaller scale that can serve a specific neighborhood um, and serve as a pocket park for, for the community as well. That sounds great. It's, it sounds like it's a real melding of uh, kind of letting everyone see this is what the land you know, used to be and naturally is, and we can still live inside of that to our benefit. That's right. So uh, 
thought Carol, you were nodding. Did you have something? <laughs> I was nodding. Well, you're just not. You know, you're just, you're just in total agreement, then, right? I'm in total agreement. So, no, I and and you know, one of the things that I love, um, and I had never heard it said this way. And this this particular group is not a bunch of engineers. But when when I hear the word cascading, I'm typically thinking of something bad, cascading failures, cascading, you know, blah blah blah. And it and and it's really fun to think of that same concept in cascading benefits and the fact that sometimes it's just a matter of getting that first thing in that begins to trigger the next thing and trigger the next thing. And all of a sudden you've got 10 or 12 decisions in a row that have resulted in, in, in a benefit that is so much bigger than that first decision. Um, and, right. and so we have to take this mindset of, of you know, the, the, the siloed individual mentality and we have to take this mindset over to a systems approach of solutions. And, and, I, and I love the concept. In my mind, I see, you know, the dominoes falling or whatever, but in a good way, like, you know, as they're falling, you know, trees are popping out and flowers are exploding and, you know, and, and it's, an, it's an awesome thing to think that we can be part of setting those first few places, first few steps in place with policies and pilot projects that will become routine and standard. Right. Uh, one last question before we get to our final speaker. Um, I think that the the audacious number of trees that are being proposed, that is awesome. Uh, is that going to need some kind of codification to get redevelopment and new developments to include uh, more trees than, than currently required? Or are these uh, going to occur in locations where, we, you know, the, we, we know we already have a dense city. Um, having a dense tree canopy inside of a dense city is achievable, but you know, are we looking at something where we're going to have to make more of, of an effort to, uh, I hate to use the word force, but you know, in some ways that, that, that may need to be what happens to get that number of trees and, and green up uh, our, our local street infrastructure. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it is a, a when you put it as 4.6 million trees, it is a tremendous number of trees. Um, and when you break it down into what our individual contribution can be of 2 million trees per Houstonian over the next 10 years, then it's something much more manageable. Um, we it's it's this is a goal that goes into the regional scale. And so when we're looking at what the city and the parks department and public works can do. Uh, what we can do in our own assets. But this is where we also heavily rely on organizations like the Houston Parks Board and Trees for Houston. Um, when we look at specifically the Urban Prairie Project and what how many trees are going to be planted there as well and, count, and, and counting them. Um, part of what uh, Director Hatta talked about is looking at our design standards um, and looking at our regulations for how do we integrate green infrastructure. And so, working specifically with the uh, tree and shrub ordinance to make sure that the trees that are being allowed, the trees that um, are being considered are, are native for this region, but there are also uh, a, a wide array of, of, of trees to, to actually implement and be able to incorporate, as well as, of course, the incentives. Um, so this is this is something very important for every for every tree uh, that that you incorporate um, and how you in integrate it into our built environment. You could potentially uh, 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 go through an expedited permitting review process if selected. Okay. You could potentially receive an award. Um, and if if it's a project that you know looks at restoring an entire area. A forest, then you could potentially be talking about it specifically for the private sector into a tax abatement. Right. Excellent. Those are great incentives. Uh, I very much appreciate it. I know all of our attendees very much appreciate you presenting today. Thank you so much for letting us know what the city of Houston has been up to and, and helping us green things up. Thank you so much, both of you. Have a good one. Thank you. So finally, uh, last but not least, uh, Tom Bacon, who is Chairman Emer Emeritus of the uh, Houston Parks Board. One of the most transformative projects that we have in our region recently um, is, is the BioGreenway Initiative. And uh, Tom is gonna talk about, uh, you know, what have we seen from benefits, but also um, kind of a, hey, what, why did it take so long? Was this really that difficult, right? <laughs> because it turned out great. So, well, you know, we got a great example. Let's do more, right, Tom? 
Um, that's where I was going to go with it. It's been a, a super interesting morning. Um, let's see, I'm popping up my screen share and let's just see if that actually uh, uh, works. Um, You're good to go. Good to go. Okay. Um, let me pop, get my, this to work a little better. And Chris, I think what would be fun with this is uh, I'm, I'm the one sitting between everybody and lunch and we are running a little bit over. And to the extent we can have this be a bit conversational, that would be great. Um, I'm going to start with just a few observations of the morning and then kind of launch into uh, what I was talking about. Um, my uh, talk was asked me the benefits of Bayou Greenways, what's been realized. And um, I wanted to, uh, I asked Chris if I could add to that, why in the world was Bayou Greenways 2020 so hard? Why did it take 15 years to do what in, in was basically a really good idea and wasn't very expensive? We've been talking about billions and a billion here and a billion there and 68 billion here there you know in another place and we really needed 220 million for bio greenways and yet it was an extraordinary hard thing to actually get done um the other observation is in just talking about the morning uh housing uh, engineering solutions were were really focused on uh, what is the quality of life in Houston? And part of the issue with the quality of life right now is we're just trying to keep everybody dry, which is kind of, uh, you know, a crazy new way to think about things, but it is the way we've been thinking about things, you know, for the 150 years as we grew to 675 square miles and have the largest population living in an unincorporated area in the United States. Um, so anyway, I like this picture. Um, I always go back to this picture when I think about Houston and, and what are we? Um, one of the things people don't know about Houston is we, we are the number one most biodiverse region in the United States. We're ranked as the number three most biodiverse urban area in the world. And that is despite the fact that we basically built a $500 billion a year economy on top of a floodplain. Um, these numbers are sort of important because as we think through a $500 billion a year economy, um, the county runs every year for $5 billion and the city of Houston runs every year for $5 billion. So um, we have an economy that's very important to the United States and we have operating budgets that are actually fairly enormous. So Bayou Greenways as a quality of life uh, component of infrastructure within that context is, you know, it's $200 million, it's kind of nickels. Um, so uh, benefits, I'm gonna do benefits fairly quickly. Um, and I hope, yeah, this shows up properly. I have a numerical issue at the top, but um, when we were trying to sell the whole idea of bio greenways, um, it's kind of strange that this is an idea that's a hundred years old. Um, we go through history and there was a period before 1945 that this had a little bit of, of momentum. That's why we have the great area that is now Buffalo Bayou Park. Um, it got momentum in the late fifties and that's why we have uh, so many of the great areas along Bray's Bayou. And, and that was all part of the original Coney plan um, that picked up some speed in the 50s and early 60s. Then got forgotten again and picked up in the 80s and Bayou Greenways in the 80s was known as the 
green rip, green ribbon committee, and then we're going to put green ribbons throughout the city. And then we dusted all that off in 2007 as we were trying to figure out like how in the world is Houston going to compete in the United States for quality of life when other cities are investing so much more money than we are in quality of life. Um, it's very hard to, you know, 2007, pretty impossible to uh, pitch uh, quality of life or green infrastructure or actually anybody was really investing in parks on any large scale. Um, Terry Hershey, uh, the reason probably all of us are here that, that uh, Terry Hershey used to sit at board meetings and she always said, well, what about the critters? What's gonna happen to the critters? And we, we finally, I, I finally like, I was so scared of Terry because she's such an intimidating presence and she's just done so much in the world. And I would say, Terry, I think if we can pitch this whole thing as something for people and economic development, the critters will be taken care of. Um, so we turned to a, a model of uh, what's the cost benefit analysis. And we went up to John Crompton up at U, at uh, AM. And John Crompton's first study broke it into nine categories that could be quantified and came up with $300 million a year in benefits. And we said, John, you don't need, we don't need $300 million a year in benefits. We need, we're only going to spend $220 million. So uh, if, if you can just get $100 million in benefits that everyone can absolutely under, understand and we can measure over time, then we will <clears throat> we'll be able to raise this money and do this thing. So physical and mental health, environmental health, economic health. Under each one of these are multiple categories. This is the, the cover slide from his uh, presentation to us. But Bayou Greenways, theoretically, is creating 117 million of value every year on a $220 million investment. What's more interesting than that is the city did a separate analysis and said in creating uh, increased tax revenues, the Bio Greenways would cash alone would create $35 million a year additionally flowing into the city. That's actually what pitched more than anything the city of Houston getting behind a $100 million bond program because with a $100 million bond program, get $35 million a year on 100 million, and that's a good investment. And those are the things that make sense to the city of Houston. So uh, I like the last line of John Crompton's study here. It says, these figures are impressive, but the primary outcome of completing the Bio Greenways could be to catapult Houston to one of the top cities in the nation in quality of place. Um, I think that's a more, I think the numerical is certainly interesting. Bayou Greenways is just now coming to completion. We will be measuring it over time, um, but it's too soon to actually get the quantification is, did we get our money's worth? I think it is pretty clear that we got our money's worth just observationally, but we are dedicated to measuring outcomes. Um, but I think the other big things that have happened with the Greenways is the enormous collaboration of the city, the county, all the green groups, Bayou Preservation, Buffalo Bayou Partnership, and, and everybody else. I mean, like so many people in this, this group on the phone have had a hand in creating by Greenways. And um, that spirit of collaboration, I think, lays a tremendous groundwork and makes us hopeful about being able to do big, audacious ideas. Um, I'm not 
going to uh, spend any time on what the greenways are. This group knows what the greenways are. I think they know the background of the uh, uh, Comey plan. So I'm going to go straight to uh, the thing that kind of drives me crazy after all this effort. And I would really like to concentrate on how do we do it better next time? Um, the Parks Board has been doing, you know, projects since 1976. When the, uh, when I came on board, it was a four person organization with a uh, annual budget of about a million dollars. And um, we had one West 11th Street Park that it took us two years of focus to raise $3 million. And we knew we needed to get, you know, do be bigger and better than that. And that's how we dusted off the Bayou Greenways. And I think in addition to collaboration, the Houston Parks Board has become a reliable partner with the city, with the county, with the other green groups, with a clear recognition that this takes, these type of things take the entire community to get them done. Uh, so I'm going to, uh, I think those, that's, that's the benefit set, collaboration, teamwork, and it's a certainly a, a quality of life. And I know it's a money-making uh, opportunity or uh, uh, project. Um, so why in Houston, Texas, does a really good idea, that's clearly a good idea, that's not very expensive, take a nonprofit group to come together behind the idea, reorganize itself entirely, build an entire team, uh, break their necks, raising 120 million. We got 100 million from the city, 120 million of other. Um, and take 15 years from concept to completion. When I think about that in the context of a city and county that operate for $10 billion combined annually, I say, where, can, where are we possibly going to be in uh, 2035 if we have another, uh, another, another big idea, another uh, uh, 15 year project. Um, and I'm gonna go back to the biodiverse piece. We're really, you know, we're Houston, we focus on economic development, we focus on people, but we are the most biodiverse region in the United States. And if we continue to proceed without taking care of biodiversity, um, then the quality of life is going to disappear and we're all going to be in a whole lot uh, ultimately worse situation. Um, I think the issue with big projects, and I thought uh, Augie and Chris did a beautiful job of going through like uh, getting a plan started and having a big plan in the 40s that we did one of three pieces, a big plan in the 50s and we did two of three pieces. We have no shortage of plans. We know we have to protect the coast and we know we need to, to do a lot of flood work. Um, but our political timelines are too short for these projects. We've sort of worked our way into probably an ungovernable to a certain extent configuration. And we do have this confusion between uh, the word zoning and the word plant. I, I think it is two four letter words, zoning, zone and plan. Planning in our environment is essential. And if we don't at the center of all this begin to decide that city planning, which is not zoning, absolutely. City planning doesn't get beefed up and have a longer term time horizon. We're gonna have a really hard time uh, 
uh, be in a great place by 2030 and 2040. So um, I'm really proud of Bio Greenways. I'm proud of everything the Parks Board have done. I'm proud of the city, the county. I'm glad that everybody who came together to do this. Um, but I'm also a little distressed that it, a good idea took so long and it wasn't very expensive. And there are a lot of good ideas uh, coming across on the screen today and will be tomorrow. How do we, uh, how do we accelerate these efforts? And uh, that's the question I'm going to leave this group with. How do we accelerate the best ideas? And um, I think that's, that may be part of the question tomorrow, but I think that's really the question of our times. And with that, Chris, I'll wrap up. So you, you said some very interesting things that reminded me of, of you know, when I was first doing presentations uh, for the Bio Greenway Initiative and, and Terry happened to be in the audience of one of my presentations. And, uh, and, and I, I had finished and said, well, look, we're, you know, we're going to invest this much money and, and here's what we think the, the benefit, real benefits are going to be and everything. And, and uh, her first question was, uh, so how long have you been working on this? And I said, well, uh, you know, uh, it's been a couple of years. It's come out of the Greater Houston Partnership Committee, and we, we've gotten these these organizations to come on board and the, the parks. And she says, "And so you have a slideshow so far." <laughs> <laughs> so to your to your point, uh, you know, I think part of the part of the the speed at which things is is just the complication of of what we have done to our to our environment in general, right? We we're haven't put enough emphasis on trying to meld built environment and natural environment, but this is who we are. And if we were to recognize that more and say, you know, emphatically, we are going to figure out how to be a great economy and a great green place at the same time. And and we're only so are, is it your position? We kind of just scratch the surface and we have so much more to do on that. Or are we, you know, there and just continue? Um, I think we've just scratched the surface. Um, I, I've been spending a fair amount of time with oil and gas people in the last uh, six months. And like, I think the oil and gas people are going to figure out how they move the fossil fuel capital of the world to becoming the clean energy capital of the world. I actually think they're going to make that happen. And that's going to be a fascinating moment. And that's people coming together and, and figuring out one of the most complex issues of our times. To me, you know, the people on this phone call, the people in biopreservation, um, the question of our times is, can we make our home that everybody, everybody always loves to underestimate Houston, but can we make our home a high quality living place? And can we deal with these issues of our times in a big way in a collaborative effort? And um, I genuinely feel we can, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm hopelessly an optimist. But uh, the only way we can is uh, it's, it's, a, it's a deep driving lever, level of leadership that accelerates uh, the big priorities. Because mm -hmm. we talk about all this stuff. I mean, we've been talking about so much of this stuff for but in 2007, we were talking about all these same topics. Yeah, it, it seems like we we actually have a history in this city of the big ideas coming not from government, but coming from you know private citizens um, or or sometimes political figures. Uh, and yeah, the realization of them, we've done some pretty audacious things over over all this time, and to have it now focused on green is is really interesting to think about. Well, first it was. Oh, I don't know. First, first say we oh we're gonna we're gonna be a port city, but we're forty miles inland. Well, okay, no problem. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna put a we're gonna put a roof over a stadium, and we're you know gonna hold baseball indoors. Okay, we can figure that out too. Man to the moon, all that. So now we're talking about green infrastructure and the opportunities for live, work, play in a great environment being the norm for how we move forward. Right. Uh, that that's right, and. Uh... Lord knows we have the land area. Um, we have plenty of space. Um, we have a configuration 
that needs serious work. Um, we recognize our 100 year floodplain has moved the old 500 year, the old 100 is now the 500. It's not like official, but that's kind of where it is. So we got some big thinking to do. Um, but what a remarkable thing if people looked at Houston in 2030 and 2040 and say, what an amazing place to live. And they grappled with those issues of the early 20th century and they moved the dial on them. Right. I'm like, I, I, I love, you know, I get tired of engineering plans and I, I can be grumpy about them. I love Augie and Chris's presentation, like the big pipe under I-10. You know, that's just like a big badass idea that, you know, I know probably it probably makes half the people mad. And I don't totally understand that. Uh, we've, we've had really interesting coastal solutions, some of which we could actually get done. Um, I can't tell if we're just going to talk about them for another 20 years until, you know, the hurricane comes up the ship channel or, uh, and I think it's tough for our political figures because Texans, they like to dislike government and they get mad when they pay a nickel for government and they want a dime's worth of uh, uh, management. And, and we starve our government, but we've got big complex cities to run. And this, this runs all the way around, you know, this is all our Texas cities, big complex cities. And uh, we starve our government and we actually need them to have Yes, the private sector comes up with so many of these ideas, but we really need the, gov the, the city government and Harris, and Harris County to be able to hold on to some long-term visions mm. that last longer than uh, the election cycle. It's just very, very hard for them. Right. Well, let's finish up with this. Um, what would you say is the, the lesson learned in what we've done so far um, with the Greenway Initiative? um that needs to be applied what is that what is that key thing or is there a key thing is there a silver bullet and we got to keep firing from all directions to to find the solution uh, what i always have said to my kids is there are uh the air is full of ideas and you have to be very careful which ideas that you reach up and grab and throw energy behind but if you get a good one then there's no telling how far you can take it and uh I think the, because BioGreenways was inexpensive and impacts a whole lot of people, I think what it can do besides being just a nice thing to have, um, that it can serve as an example of, here's a great idea. Uh, we let it hang around for a hundred years before we did it. Um, it wasn't very expensive. It was super smart. And we've got all this other stuff with beyond the bias and everything the parks board has done. Um, so the parting thought on that is what if we also use this as an example of let's not take so long to do that next time when there's, when there's really good ideas and in all these engineering solutions of 68 billion here and 25 billion there, get more dimension out of those dollars because Bio Greenways is really like the icing on the cake. The cake was already there. The underutilized infrastructure was there. In all this money that we're gonna to have to apply to our geography, take a segment of it and make sure it's focused on quality of life and accelerate everything. All right, yeah, blending Keep quality of life, yeah. Let's keep our feet on the uh, feet on the accelerator. I love it. There's there's today's final thought, everybody. Okay. Tom, thank you so much for your presentation and your chat. I know everyone appreciates it. And uh, we have another day of this tomorrow, everyone. Uh, we hope that uh, you'll come back. Uh, we've got some different attendees. Uh, but uh, for certain, we have some different presentations. We're going to be hearing some outside voices, uh, what they think of, of what we've done, some different opinions uh, from outside, some of the outlying counties giving some presentations, uh, but also some specific project examples so we can continue to see what we've already done that use uh, these techniques to great advantage and great success that we can replicate and continue on in our area. So 
Thank you everyone for your participation today. Um, I'm just gonna judge by uh, the time we went over that this was a very successful day. Uh, hopefully uh, you were able to uh, absorb this inside your lunch hour, uh, but uh, thank you so much for today. We're adjourned and we will see you tomorrow, everyone.